The Dangers of Waking a Tired Alicorn by Coronet de Lessa. <sighs> Spike yawned as he lounged lackadaisically on Twilight's throne. He casually flipped through the latest issue of Power Ponies, barely interested in whatever was on the page. Of course, technically, he shouldn't have been reading comics when on court business. Generally, Spike would take this position as royal advisor very seriously in Twilight's absence. But today, Canterlot Castle was utterly serene. An incredibly odd thing to note, as the nerve center of the equestrian government usually constituted an unending hive of activity. No noisy courtiers or hard-pressed aides could be found darting back and forth delivering government business. Instead, it was deathly quiet. Not that he minded too much, hence the casual comic reading. Spike shrugged to himself, it was just going to be one of those days. That was what he initially thought at least. He found himself rudely disturbed by the doors to the throne room being thrown up with a thunderous thud. Spike's comic book flew into the air as he attempted to regain some royal composure. In sprinted the familiar faces of his Ponyville friends speeding towards the throne, vivid concern etched upon their faces. Spike gulped. This could only be bad. Starlight was the first to approach him, a panicked expression on her face. Spike! Starlight called. Somehow, Grogar has returned. All of her friends nodded solemnly. Spike's eyes went wide and he started to shake physically. What? exclaimed Spike, standing up from his seat on the smaller throne. How is even possible? Grogar was banished to the void by Gusty the Great. Dark magics, evil essence transfer rituals. Sunburst piped in from behind Starlight, currently flicking through some old looking tome. Secrets only a dark lord would be aware of. Spike cocked an eyebrow. We are being that vague about this, huh? Spike! Snapped Starlight. This isn't the time. It just had to be a vile necromancer, didn't it? Can't we ever fight a villain that is hygienic? Rarity whined. Spike, where is Twilight? Applejack asked, motioning with a hoof towards the throne. We need the elements right now. They all had gathered around Spike expectantly, awaiting his explanation for Twilight's absence. He fiddled with his claws and shuffled a sole foot back and forth. He clicked his tongue as if trying to find the proper way to phrase his response. Several of the group began to throw questioning looks in his direction as his silence continued. Um, he stated, she, she's not available at the moment. A stunned silence followed Spike's statement as several O oh, friends gawked at him. Applejack in particular looked particularly unimpressed. Not available? She questions. Rainbow snorted angrily, pushing away past everyone else until she stood directly in front of Spike. Spike, cut the ball. Where's Twilight? Rainbow demanded. Spike glanced nervously between the looming Rainbow and every pony else. He laughed to himself and felt sweat dripping down his face. Sh she's asleep, he answered quietly. What? Rainbow tilted her head to the side in confusion. Spike, enough jokes. Where is Twilight for real this time? Starlight said incessantly. I told you she is asleep, Spike repeated, this time with more emphasis. Oh, I'll go wake her up. Pinky declared happily as she hopped away. Spike launched himself toward her, grabbing her tail and holding her in place. No, Pinky, don't, he urged. You can't wake Twilight up. Spike, darling, while we all appreciate your concern for Twilight's sleep schedule, soothed Rarity, gently patting Spike's back before grabbing him roughly with her magic, bringing him close to her face. I don't know if you are aware, but the actual Grogar is on his way and it would be quite necessary for Twilight's presence. I would feel terrible waking Twilight up, but um, it does seem pretty serious. Fluttershy interjected. Spike wriggled himself out of Rarity's magical grip, 
falling with a thud to the floor. Look, girls, I get it, Spike said as he dusted himself off the floor and looked pleadingly at the group. But it would be a terrible idea to get Twilight up. Trust me on this. Spike turned to Starlight. Can't the pillars or students from the school do it? I mean, just for once? Why are we always the one cleaning up the villains? It feels like we deal with whatever pops out of history's trash can every weekend. The pillars are spread all across Equestria, Starlight answered, most unimpressed. It will take days for them to arrive. And besides, this isn't the time to delegate a bunch of high school students. This is the Dark Lord, Spike. Just get Twilight up. I, I can't, Spike murmured. His eyes immediately fell towards the floor, away from the disapproving gazes of his friends. Can't or won't, Rainbow snapped. Can it be both? He asked sheepishly, scratching the back of his head. The thunderous bang of the doors swinging open again gave Spike a brief respite. In entered the former princesses of Equestria, Celestia and Luna in their full majesty, golden light haloing their entrance and grim determination on their faces, but their appearance did little to calm Spike's growing anxiety. If the former princesses were present, then this Grogar was pretty serious business. We came as soon as we could, Luna said breathlessly. Is there word on Grogar's location? Celestia asked, not even bothering with the usual pleasantries. It indicated how serious she was taking the Ram King's return. No, but we know he's headed this way, Starlight said as she turned to them. Rumor has it he wants to challenge Twilight directly. That can only mean that he's coming to Cantalot. Celestia shared a grimace with Luna, who nodded sternly. Their resolve was stilled. They knew what was coming. Then we will need to get the elements ready, Celestia said commandingly. Celestia's iron stare scanned the mares before her, who all returned it with a committed nod. Celestia faltered though, when she noticed that some pony was absent. She scanned the room back and forth. Where is Twilight? She's asleep apparently, Applejack scoffed. Luna blinked several times. Celestia cocked her head to the side. An awkward silence followed for several moments. What? Celestia pushed forward to be in front of Spike. Spike, now is not the time for a sleeping. We require Twilight immediately. Spike looked practically pale before the solar monarch. He twiddled his claws nervously several times. I know, he cried frustratingly. Look, I get it. He extended the flat of his palms out to the assembled crowd. But this is Twilight's first day off in six months. She's been working non-stop for days on end after the latest diplomatic summit. Spike sighed as he attended to calm himself down. She made it crystal clear she's not to be disturbed. Spike crossed his arms and huffed. It's a royal order. Is this form of a modern joke I am not aware of? It's not particularly funny, Luna stated. Celestia gawked at Spike in dismay. Spike, the fate of the world is at stake. Have you seen Twilight when her nap is interrupted? Spike countered. While I'm sure Twilight Sparkle is not the best character when awoken from her slumber, this is hardly the time to ponder upon her general state. Luna snorted. Grogar means to destroy life upon this earth itself. No, girls, this is different, Spike declared. Look, I don't want to wake Twilight unless at the greatest need. Seriously, Rainbow shouted. And this isn't that? Spike shook his head. Spike! Starlight snapped. The group descended in a flurry of shouts as each pony jostled to be heard. All the while, Spike stood in the centre, desperately pleading his case before the irritated group. Not that they had much time to argue further when the doors to the throne room exploded in a storm of splinters. Celestia threw up a golden shield encompassing the group to deflect the projectiles. A great shadow loomed over the throne when the dust settled from the sudden intrusion. He was greater than Celestia by at least a foot. His curved horns sat like a wicked crown upon his narrow face. 
His red and gold eyes gleamed dangerously in the dim before a cruel twisted smile danced upon his lips. Good evening, little ponies. He hissed. The low baritone of his voice echoed throughout the room. The tiles beneath the floor shattered beneath his mammoth hoof. I, Grogar the Unholy, have returned. He roared. The crack of thunder sounded outside. Grogar! Celestia shouted. You shall not pass! The darkness retreated as gleaming yellow light radiated from the former solar monarch. Soon Celestia's light was joined by a paler light, less lustrous than her sister's but equally hardy. The elements were quick to form up behind the former princess, their faces determined in the face of the great threat before them. Yet, even though they were without twilight, none of them wavered in the face of danger. Groger let forth a dreadful laugh. He let his gaze linger across his opponents one by one. His smile grew wider with each passing moment. Fools, do you really believe this motley band of insects can stand before me? Another laugh rang out through the halls. Grogar gathered the shadows around himself, forming a mass of dreadful appendages. Let your defiant words be as meaningless as your deaths. Far above the action of the throne room, Grogar's words shook the foundation of the castle. Stone chips fell from the ceiling as ponies rushed about in a panic-stricken state. In the tallest tower of the castle lay the royal apartments. Within the spacious room, the curtains were drawn to prevent any intrusive light from entering. At the centre lay a large bed that could fit several ponies, layers of blankets piled high over a resting figure. The room was cool and most importantly, utterly silent except for the occasional snore of the pony that occupied the bed. A place where the noise, chaos and stress of everyday life lay far, far away. It was perfection. That was until the roof shook, destroying the peaceful environment. The figure in the bed rolled furtively in their sleep, trying desperately to ignore the noise. Then, the roof practically jumped when another vibration wave rocked the castle. The crack of magical energy reverbed as loud as any multitude of fireworks. The figure under the covers groaned as she grabbed a nearby pillow and placed it over her ears. Then, desperate to push out the intrusion into their little slice of Nirvana. Another booming laugh shook the room, taking a small piece of the ceiling crashing against the room's floor. The cushions could not smother the sound. The pony groaned and tossed and turned furiously. When the castle shuddered especially violently, there could be no more ignoring the matter. The resting figure's bloodshot eyes open. Celestia recoiled as the weight of Grogar's shadow tendrils slammed against her shield. Luna's horn let forth an arcing wave of magical energy in response. The tendril dissipated, only for it to be instantly reformed. Starlight, take the remaining elements and get Twilight! Celestia said through gritted teeth. We will hold them off as long as we can. We ain't leaving, Applejack declared. No way, Rainbow added. The rest of the group nodded in collective determination, unwilling to leave the two princesses to fight the Dark Lord alone. Friends, this foe is beyond you. It is best to fight another day. Luna bellowed as she let forth a wave of crystal bolts. Grogar casually smashed them away. Several tendrils launched towards Luna. Celestia intercepted them, a great burst from her horn, dispersing them briefly. Grogar snorted in amusement. Delay me? 
Listen to your worthless prattle. Do you not see death when it approaches? He triumphantly grinned, ready to renew his attack once more. But his attack died just before he unleashed it. Grogar had stopped the build up to the spell and sniffed the air. Something wicked comes this way. The back doors to the throne room swung open. Every pony turned to the noise and the new entrant, Grogar, squinted in that direction. Within the shadow of the door stood a slackened but recognisable figure. It was Twilight, but not as every pony knew her. Twilight looked terrible. Her coat was matted and clearly unbrushed. Her hair was a tangled, unkempt mess, not brushed from whatever bed she had emerged from. Most noticeably, her eyes were wide open and bloodshot, and rings of dark circles sat beneath her eyes. Had it not been clear that she had just been sleeping, she may have looked frightening, but instead she ponderously moved into the throne room, barely taking notice of the great battle before her. She didn't even throw a wayward glance at her assembled friends. Spike! drawled Twilight as she approached a thoroughly abashed Spike. He wasn't sure, but had she gotten taller, she practically looked over him. What's going on? I thought I told you to keep it down! Grogar snarled angrily as he spoke. Princess, I demand... Quiet! Twilight interrupted him quite evenly. I was not speaking to you. She kept her unsteady gaze on Spike. She casually rubbed her eyes with a hoot. Spike? Well, try, I tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen, he mumbled. I really did. Don't be mad. Twilight sighed deeply. Me? Mad? No. Twilight yawned again. <sighs> Annoyed would be more accurate. What did I tell you about parties in the throne room? Before Spike could answer, Grogar slammed his hoof down against the floor, cracking several tiles. Princess Twilight! He roared. Behold, your ruin has arrived. I will subjugate you to horrors you and your friends can only imagine. Only when your mind is at its greatest breaking point, when your despair reaches its crescendo, I will only gift you the sweet release at the end. Grogar smiled devilishly, practically leering in Twilight's direction. The small mare had finally turned to face the great ram. A large frown adorned her features. Are you quite finished? Twilight said with a snort. Grogar's mouth hung open in bewilderment. What? He boomed, shaking the very walls. Do you have to shout? Twilight grumbled angrily, practically a snarl. Every. Single. Word. She caressed the top of her head with a free hoot. Do you have no consideration for others, or are you just that stupid? Dead silence followed. Her friends stood still in shock. Had Twilight just lost her mind? No one knew what they should do. A few glanced at the terrifying Dark Lord, who seemed to shake in visible anger at being reprimanded by a pony of all creatures. Grogar drew himself up. The shadows coalesced around him until the very sun itself dimmed. His words were like the rumble of a volcano, and the aura of his fury warped the exact space he occupied. You dare speak to me like that? Do you know who I am? I am the Widow's Wail, the Black Death, the blood-soaked tyrant! I know who you are! Twilight huffed, then quickly yawned again. <sighs> She slowly drew herself towards him. I just don't care. I get one day off every six months. She furiously jabbed her hoof against her leg. And today is that day. She stabbed her hoof more insistently this time. So I will ask you once to leave right now. Twilight fixed Grogar with an utterly deadpan stare as if she were a parent staring at a disapproving foal. Or are we going to have a problem? She then cracked her head to the side and repeated the action on the other side. Her eyes never left Grogar. You fool! Grogar roared. Do you not perceive your own end? I am the end. I am the gathering darkness, the shadow of the abyss born from the darkness of the void. And now I have come for... Before Grogar could speak any further, 
He was lifted into the air and promptly dropped against the floor, roughly creating a small crater. Then before he could gain his bearings, he was slammed to the floor again, and again, and again. The group's initial shock at Twilight's action gave way to uncomfortable silence as she physically dominated the most powerful dark being in history. All the while, Twilight sported an expression that was a mix of exhaustion and indifference. Then as he was lifted into the air a final time before he could say any more, he was gone. The only indication of where the Dark Lord had gone was an ominous hole in the roof of the throne room. The crumbled stone falling to the floor where he had just stood. Twilight's friend stared open mouthed at the ceiling though Luna could not take her eyes off the ram-shaped impression on the stone floor. Where did he go? Starlight whispered. Away, Twilight answered, turning around to the throne. But where? Rarity queried with a breathless gasp. To some place he won't be noisy, Twilight retorted tersely as she climbed the steps to take place upon its comfortable surface. Will he be back? Applejack asked, all still in her voice. Maybe, I don't think so, Twilight yawned. <sighs> Atmosphere is quite high. Hmm, not sure if he can fly, don't care. Twilight yawned thrice before she curled up into a ball. <sighs> Spike, be good now, no more friends over, okay? She slurred. I'm just going to rest my eyes for a moment. Then, after a few more moments, the soft noise of her snores echoed through the thoroughly ruined throne room as more plaster fell against the floor. Twilight smiled as sleep claimed her. The castle's blissful silence had returned, with it her much needed rest. I did try to warn you, Spike sighed, surveying the mess. What the buck just happened? Rainbow Dash cried. Twilight Tries to Have a Good Time by Local Medic Main. It's a beautiful day out. Birds sing in the distance, waves gently crash against the shore. A wonderful day to be out in the ocean. It's nice to relax with all her friends after all the friendship quests they've been through and the ludicrous work of managing a whole school. Twilight opens her eyes, spotting Pinky, Applejack and Rainbow Dash playing poof ball in the water. Applejack and Rainbow start glaring intensely at Pinky because she won almost at least 50 times while they hadn't even won once. They tackled her, but Pinky slipped away easily and started running away as her two furious friends gave chase. Twilight let out a light-hearted snicker at her friend's shenanigans. Twilight's eyes move from the water and goes up at the shore and sees Rarity and Fluttershy chatting their day away while sunbathing under the sun. Occasionally letting loose small bursts of laughter, she looks to their left spotting the three little fillies that plead to them until their sisters brought them along. Twilight rolls her eyes as the thought passes through their head she sees that they are building a large sand castle. Sweetie Belle was shaping the castle with her magic. Scoot Lou was bringing buckets of water from the sea to harden the sand, while Apple Bloom was doing her best decorating it. Twilight smiled at the three fillies working together. Twilight looks up at Celestia's sun up in the sky, letting loose a sigh, and then she closes her eyes, focusing on the relaxing feeling of a floatable ring bobbing up and down as waves roll by. Twilight wakes from her almost trance-like state after hearing something odd, a ukulele being played. While that in itself is not weird, especially at the beach, what is weird, however, is the fact that it seems to be coming from under the water. What the hey? Twilight muttered to herself after hearing the strange ukulele. 
and Twilight opens her eyes looking into the water trying to determine where the sound is coming from. Twilight then notices a large dark mass rapidly moving up from under the water. Twilight is frozen both confusion and curiosity at what it could be. The large dark mass submerges beside her covering her in water blinding her temporarily. While she is blinded she hears a male voice singing beside her. I conquered the pesky shark, the one haunting all my dreams. I watched the light leave his eyes, all while his parents screamed. After Twilight recovers from her temporary blindness and looks up to see what's beside her, her eyes go wide as she takes in the strange view of a nun on top of a dead shark playing a ukulele while wearing a necklace of shark teeth. A nun? Why are you on top of a shark playing a ukulele while singing? Twilight looked at Anon, surprised at the fact he managed to kill a shark and was singing a song about it. Anon completely ignored Twilight and continued singing on top of his dead mount. Now look at the world around me, the water is safe at last. Now I'm the one who's in charge, the fish about to be taxed. Anon says the last part with a crazed look, staring right into Twilight's soul, boring right into it. She can feel her fight or flight reflexes kick in under the pressure. Anon, don't look at me like that. You're creeping me out. Twilight backs away from Anon slowly. Anon's face visibly relaxes before continuing with his, as much as Twilight hates to admit it, nice song. Under the sea, hey. under the sea, under the sea, at the beautiful sunny shore, in the light sea, baby I'm free. As Anon sang, Twilight could swear on Celestia's large bubble butt that she could hear ethereal voices singing alongside Anon. Anon, what did you do? Twilight asks him in fear as the ethereal voices sound more and more like him blending together as he sings. Anon disregards Twilight's comments and continued to sing without pause with his ever cheerful voice. Spending the entire day on my prey Staring at this stupid shark's face Now I'm just vibing, full time to chillin' Anon looked right at shark's still dead face before folding his leg up Closing his eyes and resting his back against the shark's fin Twilight honestly didn't know what to say or do as Anon continued to strum his ukulele, taking a small break from singing. Twilight looks at the shark's dead expressions and sees that all his teeth have been ripped out and is now hung around Anon's neck. Twilight takes a deep breath in and out, trying not to panic as the shark's blood pools on top of the water. Anon, how did you... Twilight is interrupted as the non starts singing again. I brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. Anon finally stops strumming his ukulele, putting it at his side, finally finishing his song. Once he's done putting the ukulele, he looks at Twilight. You were asking? Anon smiled at Twilight smugly. One of Twilight's eyes twitches as strands from her hair start going into random directions while Twilight's ears also start turning red as smoke bellowed from them. She takes a long deep breath in and out, repeating the process five times until her ears are no longer steaming like a kettle. She looks at Anon. How did you kill that shark Anon? And don't make up anything or I'll show you what my horn can be used for aside from magic, Twilight says in a warning tone. Anon lets loose a low whistle. Kinky, aren't you? But sure, I'll tell you how. Anon grabs a small knife from his pocket, throwing it hilt first at Twilight. I stabbed that shark to death, Anon said, as he leaned back putting one hand behind his head and inspecting the other hand's nails. Twilight deadpanned at him for a few minutes before picking him up with her magic, then teleporting him and his ukulele to the castle. Twilight then vaporized the dead shark's body. She sank into her floatable ring and fell into a deep sleep, already tired from having to deal with a nun. 
Anon is teleported to the castle, falling bum first on the floor. Oh, I think I fell on my balls, Anon said before his ukulele fell on his head, breaking and knocking him out for the foreseeable few hours. A tired starlight sits by a nearby table, watching Anon's now unconscious body, occasionally taking a sip from her coffee. I don't get paid enough to babysit an entire school, let alone a man-child, Starlight said to no one in particular before slamming her head on the table. The Friendship Express Dilemma by Hamster Wizard The exact nature of the situation is irrelevant. The problem seeks to answer a moral quandary. Rainbow Dash raised a hoof once more. Twilight flicked her pointer in her friend's direction. No, for the last time, there is no way to stop the trolley. Rainbow Dash slowly lowered her hoof. Twilight then flicked her pointer back toward her chalkboard, tapping on the rudimentary drawing. It depicted a trolley approaching a fork in the tracks, with five ponies on the straightway and a single pony on the alternate path. Off the side, there was a drawing of a pony who appeared to be Trixie, standing beside a lever. Applejack then spoke up. Well, ain't much of a question if and you all ask me. Saving five ponies are a heck of a lot better than saving one. Yes, but you are doing so at the cost of another pony's life. A death which you are responsible for, Twilight rebutted. Fluttershy spoke next. Um, aren't you responsible for the death of the other five if you do nothing? Twilight leaned in, uncomfortably close to Fluttershy's face. Are you? She whispered. That's the way I figure it. Some pony dies whichever way you slice it, so you may as well save as many ponies as you can. Applejack nodded. Yes, dear, but how could you live with yourself after causing the death of another pony? Rarity asked. Applejack pulled her hat down. We all must live with our sins, Rarity, trudging ever forward through this cruel joke we call life. An awkward silence fell over the room. I mean, oh shucks, I sure love apples. Right, well, what about you, Starlight? You've been awfully quiet, Twilight said. Starlight Glimmer, who had been leaning back in her chair nonchalantly, snapped her attention back to the topic. Oh, well, I wouldn't pull the lever. Because you couldn't hurt another pony, right? Fluttershy asked. Huh? No, if the five ponies are too stupid to get out of the way, then they deserve to die, Starlight answered. Every pony was silent for a moment before Rainbow Dash spoke up. Starlight, they're tied to the tracks. How can you know that for sure? How do you know they're tied to the tracks? Starlight asked. Twilight face hoofed. Starlight, the semantics don't matter. The point is that if you do nothing, five ponies die. But if you pull the lever, then one pony dies. Starlight tilted her head. And I know that because... It doesn't matter for the sake of hypothetical argument. You just know. It doesn't even need to be a trolley. Twilight shouted. Starlight pouted. Okay, geez. I'd pull the lever then. And kill the other pony? Twilight asked. Yeah, sure, whatever. But how can you be sure that's the morally correct choice? Twilight asked. Starlight shrugged. If I do nothing, I kill other five through my inaction. Applejack nodded. Yep, that's what I figured. But like, what if I could outfly the trolley? Oh, for the love of Rainbow, for the sake of argument, the trolley is moving infinitely fast. You cannot outfly it, Twilight groaned. Um... If it's moving infinitely fast, then shouldn't we not have time to pull the lever? Fluttershy asked. Starlight piped up. Actually, an object's mass increases the closer it gets to the speed of light. Anything moving at infinite speed would theoretically destroy the entire planet, making the entire exercise meaningless. What if I stopped the pony who tied them to the tracks before they did it? Rainbow sounded smug. Twilight's eye twitched. You can't. Why not? Rainbow asked. Starlight smirked. Yeah, why not, Twy? You just can't, okay? Dash opened her mouth once more. But what if... It's hypothetical, Dash. We are just assuming that all you may do in the situation is pull the lever or not pull the lever. That is all, Twilight said, sounding rather irate. 
Rainbow put a hoof to a chin in thought for a moment, and did indeed manifest a thought. What if I, hypothetically, could outfly the hypothetical trolley, she said, making air quotes with her hooves. Twilight ignored her, turning back to her friends. Rarity, how about you then? The train is not destroying the entire planet then? Rarity asked cautiously. No. But it is still moving too fast to stop or untie the ponies from the tracks? Yes. Oh my, this is quite a conundrum. Rarity pondered the question for a moment before speaking. I believe I would pull the lever and simply bear the guilt myself. Twilight nodded. Most ponies say that they would pull the lever, reasoning that they are responsible for the death of the five if they do nothing, and that five lives are worth more than one. However, Twilight flipped the chalkboard over, revealing a similar drawing, only this time the pony beside the lever was Applejack, and the single pony on the branching path was Apple Bloom. Twilight smiled at the gathered ponies. Who would pull the lever now? Starlight raised her hoof, and every pony glared at her. What? she asked. Starlight, that's Apple Bloom! Applejack shouted. Who? My sister! Oh! Starlight lowered her hoof. Twilight nodded to herself. Applejack, would you care to explain your change of heart? Well, family comes first after all. Applejack nodded. But are you not then responsible for the death of the five ponies on the other track? Twilight asked. No, nah, not like I tied them up. Right then, Starlight, earlier you said that if you do nothing, the other five die through your inaction, Twilight said. Yeah, true, Starlight responded. And you would let the other five die to save a pony you know? Yep. Starlight leaned back in her chair. Wow, that's cold, Rainbow said. I think it's rather touching that Starlight would kill five ponies to save Apple Bloom, Rarity said. Twilight shuffled uncomfortably a bit as she spoke. Anyways, most ponies, even after saying they would pull the lever and let one stranger die, wouldn't pull the lever if some pony they know would die. This is because the life of a friend or family member is worth more to them than the five strangers, even though the five lives is worth more than one. What about you, Twilight? Starlight asked. Twilight straightened her posture. I have actually given this some thought. As princess, it's my duty to remain impartial and no matter who was on the other track, it is my obligation to save as many ponies as possible. Well, okay then. Rainbow Dash scoffed. Looking around, Twilight could see the disappointment on her friend's faces. Really, Twilight? Fluttershy deadpanned at her. What? Twilight asked. I mean, I would have left that lever alone if it was you on the other track, Try, But now I ain't so sure. Applejack sounded disappointed. Some princess of friendship, Starlight said disapprovingly. And here I thought we were all friends, darling. Rarity flicked her head away from Twilight. We are friends, and as my friends I would expect any of you to do the same to me, Twilight retorted. I can't believe you wouldn't kill five ponies to save me. Fluttershy sounded on the verge of tears as she spoke. What? I can't believe we're even discussing this. Of course I wouldn't kill five innocent ponies to save you, Twilight yelled in disbelief. Fluttershy then actually began crying, and Rainbow had to put a hoof around her in comfort. Twilight reached out a hoof. Fluttershy, I... Rarity slapped Twilight across the cheek, but since she has hooves instead of hands, she basically just punched her in the face. Then she shouted, I think you've done enough! Yeah! Rainbow added helpfully. What the... I don't... It's hypothetical! The next day. And now they're all ignoring me over a stupid thought experiment. Can you believe that? Derpy nodded her head. I really do sympathize with you, Twilight, but I actually deliver mail to the entire town and I'm running really late because of this. She made a move to step out of the castle doorway, but Twilight kept talking. Every pony agreed that it's morally correct to pull the lever, 
But when I want to pull the letter, they're all, Oh, Twilight, how can you be so cruel? The hypocrisy. <laughs> Twilight! Pinkie Pie dropped in from the ceiling, scaring the daylights out of both ponies and giving Derpy the perfect excuse to flee at high speeds. Pinky, I'm so glad to see you, Twilight sounded relieved. There's no time, Twilight! Quick, teleport us to longitude 27.56, latitude minus 69.28. Why? What's going on? What part of no time was unclear? Twilight lit her horn, and with a pop, the two of them reappeared in the middle of nowhere. There was a grassy field around them on all sides, and the two of them were standing beside a railroad track. And right beside them was a lever. There's a train coming down the tracks, Twilight, and there's five ponies tied to the rails. What do we do? Pinky shouted directly in Twilight's face. Twilight frowned. Is this a prank? Is that what this is? No, look! Pinky passed Twilight a pair of binoculars she just sort of had, and Twilight took a look down the track. Sure enough, tied to the track with five ponies, all struggling to break loose. Now look on the other track! Pinky almost screamed. Twilight looked, and to her horror, she could see Spike, all alone, tied to the other track. Right now, the train is on course to run over those five ponies, but if we pull that lever there, then it will change course and run over Spike. Oh, Twilight, this is horrible! Pinky dramatically fell over. Twilight began sweating. Okay, okay, this is fine. Pinky, you pull the lever, I'll fly over there and untie Spike. You can't. There's some sort of wall of psychic energy keeping us away. I'll teleport. You can't teleport past it. I'll go stop the train then. You need to pass the barrier to do that. I'll make a spell to destroy the barrier. There's no time, Twilight. The train will be here in 30 seconds. Pinky screamed. Sure enough, Twilight could feel the rumble as the train drew nearer to the fork. She could see it now, plumes of smoke billowing from the locomotive. Twilight was pretty much having a panic attack. She was hyperventilating and fanning her face with her wings, trying to calm down. I can do this! I can do this! I can do this! Pinky, you decide! She turned to find Pinky attempting to tie herself to the tracks. Pinky! A giant timer appeared in the sky, slowly counting down from ten. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! And then everything was suddenly on fire. I can't! Twilight shut her eyes and huddled up on the floor. Suddenly everything stopped. Twilight cracked open her eye to find Princess Luna standing over her. Oh, this is a dream. That makes sense. Twilight chuckled, but Luna didn't seem nearly as amused. The field they were in slowly faded away until the two of them were alone in an endless white expanse. Twilight Sparkle, we are not too proud to admit that we have no idea what this is supposed to mean. Wouldst thou kindly explain the nature of this nightmare? Luna calmly asked. Twilight then spent some time explaining the details of her thought experiment, followed by yesterday's events, which of course led her to her current distress and her friend's irritation with her. Luna followed along as best as she could, saving most of her questions until the end. When Twilight's story was finished, Luna pondered all she had heard and asked a simple question. Is there any reason why we cannot stop the trolley? Several hours later, in dream time, so about three minutes of real time, We understand now. It would seem that you owe thine friends an apology, Twilight Sparkle. I know I upset them, but how is it unreasonable to say that you wouldn't let five innocent ponies die to save them? Twilight grumbled. Indeed, it is only five after all, a small price to pay. It may be difficult, but in the past, we have slain countless innocents to protect those dear to us. Wait, what? It was more socially acceptable at the time. Twilight scratched her head. So you're saying I should be willing to let innocent ponies die to save my friends? Yes. 
that's sort of messed up. It is, although perhaps you should not have breached the topic to begin with if you were not prepared for the consequences. Also, you could have just lied, you know, to not sound like a tool. Luna stood up and stretched. Our work here is done. Fare thee well, Twilight Sparkle. She then turned around and walked away, eventually fading out of sight. I think I know how to fix this now, Twilight exclaimed to herself, alone within the endless expanse of her own mind. The next day, for real this time, Rainbow Dash, Fluttershy, Applejack, Rarity and Starlight Glimmer had all received a correspondence early in the morning requesting their presence on the train platform at 9.15. They had all arrived at relatively the same time to find Twilight Sparkle waiting there, standing in front of a curtain with a sheepish grin on her face. Every pony, thanks for coming here. I just wanted to say that I'm sorry and that I was wrong. I hurt all of you with what I said and I really shouldn't have. You all mean more to me than the entire world and I would have made that clear. So let me prove it to you. Twilight finished her introduction and turned around, pulling away the curtain to reveal that off in the distance, five ponies were tied to the railroad track. Branching off on another track, the group could see Pinkie Pie also tied up, waving at them enthusiastically and with a big grin on her face. Twilight turned back to the group with an eerie smile. The five of them suddenly became acutely aware of the broken lever beside Twilight. Now, at 9.20, the Friendship Express is scheduled to arrive at the station. John Marsden and the Unicorn Story written by Slippin' Sweetie Clouds hang over the Mexican frontier as a lone horse and rider trek across the lonely dirt roads that lay empty, barren of any living travellers or animals. What was once a quiet and comforting sight had become an uneasy and dangerous setting for a potential attack. It had only been a few days since the outbreak. It seemed to happen overnight. The disease and illness slipping under the cover of the night before overtaking his beloved son and wife. The man, scarred and grizzled, his slim and narrow face devoid of expression as he scanned the horizon, noting the large orange rocky cliffs and large storm clouds tucking the sun away from view. The cowboy sighed as he took off his leather hat and fanned himself with it. The humidity was starting to soak his shirt. The smell of sweat and dirt permeating through the air before the sickening scent of decay and blood filled the man's nostrils. Suddenly a sharp whinny escaped his stallion as a strained groan broke the uneasy silence as a pair of decaying hands suddenly grasped John's hip and threw him off his horse. The man shouted as he was thrown to the ground looking up to see a half-rotted corpse standing over John, with his back hunched over, his the left side of his ribcage exposed, his hair and nails overgrown and unkempt, blood, mucus and pus oozing from his mouth and yellow eyes. The beast grunted and screeched as the hell spawn swayed wildly up and down before attempting to pounce on John. The cowboy quickly drew his revolver and placed a bullet right between the creature's eyes. The heavy, dull sound of the monster's body hitting the ground as John slowly climbed to its feet. 
seeing that his stallion had run off without him after being spooked. Slipping his fingers in his mouth, he whistled before calling out to the empty badlands around him. Horse! Come here, boy! called John. A minute passed as John examined the landscape, combing through the cacti and shrubbery for his horse. A dull anger and frustration bloomed as he sighed. God damn it! grumbled John. A crack of thunder boomed as lightning crackled across the empty sky before thick, heavy droplets of water began falling on the earth below. John grunted as he began walking the road ahead of him. A sour expression pinned his face as the rain came pouring down. Hours passed and the rain had finally let up as the orangish hue of the setting sun slipped through the storm clouds. John was soaked. His jean jacket, shirt, jeans and hair were doused in the rain, covering John in a pound of water and the sticky humidity that came with it. John quietly pondered when he'd get to the nearest functioning town. He was fortunate to not encounter any hordes of the undead or opportunistic bandits stalking the countryside. Thankful for any ammunition not spent on a man already past tense. John wondered if there was any irony in killing a man twice, but reasoned that irony was beneath him in a state like this. There was only so much humour in a situation and chewing the bit about it only seemed to tempt fate and the last thing Mr. Marston needed was to tempt his future and fate any more than he already had. His train of thought was interrupted by a shrill scream coming from the left, off the side of the road, quickly snapping his attention to the small group of undead monsters chasing something. John couldn't quite make out what it was from the mass of bodies surrounding it and chasing it around, but he quickly grabbed his repeater from his back racking the lever before shouldering the weapon as he narrowed his good eye down the barrel and iron sights. Wonder if I had killed any of you before, muttered John as he squeezed the trigger of the weapon, a loud <laughs> crackling through the air as the gunslinger racked the repeater's lever and fired again. The bullet struck the skull of one of the demons before firing again three more times. John exhaled as he relaxed slowly lowering his repeater as he looked across the road to see the carnage, looking for any human remains or someone left standing. John cocked a brow at the sight of a purple mare cowering over the mass of corpses that surrounded her. Stepping off the main road before trekking across the wilderness to meet the creature he spared from being eaten, curious to see the pony's purple coat and branded mark on its flank, John mused as he slipped the repeater over his back and placed his hands on his gun belt and hips as he approached the creature. Well, it ain't every day you see a purple horse. I'm a unicorn and a pony, replied the purple pony as she panted heavily, looking up at the human with fear and confusion. You're not going to try and eat me, are you? Not until you're properly prepared and seasoned, replied John. What? what cried the pony. I'm joking. So, unicorns are real? I suppose I owe Jack an apology, replied John as he rubbed his chin and stubble before spitting a wad of mucus beside him. <coughs> pony winced at the man spitting in front of her and she gave a bewildered expression. What do you mean, real? Who's Jack? Who are you? And what's going on? cried the pony. John looked around to see if any living soul was near, feeling unsure of his own sanity as he started talking to the horse. Um, my name's John Marsden, and I've been trying to figure this out myself. Do you have any idea where the nearest town is? 
I don't rightly know where I am or where anything is. I just remember trying to enter the magic mirror and cast a spell and... John cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Let's start with your name and where you came from, he said as he prevented himself from being any more confused than he already was. The pony trotted awkwardly in place as she glanced around the bodies around her. Can we, um, walk and talk? Sure, replied John. Not like I have anything better to do as of now. The mayor quickly joined the man as they walked back to the road and then began travelling down it together. You asked for my name? It's, uh, Twilight Sparkle, said Twilight. John glanced down at Twilight, his expression muted and reserved, but his eyes revealing a curiosity and uneasiness towards the pony. That's certainly a name. And I'm from Equestria. Have you heard of it? No. Twilight bit her lip as she winced, slowly looking up at the human. Is there magic here? Probably. Maybe. I'm not too sure, but given how strange everything up until now has been, I wouldn't take magic out of the question, answered John. What about the magic of friendship? inquired Twilight. I wouldn't know too much about that. I'm not the best person to talk about when it comes to making friends chuckled John. What happens now? asked Twilight. John shrugged. I reckon we'll go into town and part ways then. That is if the next town isn't overrun with those blood-sucking monsters. You're free to do as you please. I've got my own list of problems to deal with. How are you so calm and accepting about all of this? You're not my first talking animal, surprisingly enough. You're only a fraction of the peculiarities and horrors I've seen, answered John. And, well, I'm not accepting of any of this. Just calm, because I have to be. Twilight Sparkle Tries to Write a Klopfic by Solace Twilight Sparkle sat at her desk, haunched forwards with a quill rested gently against her chin. She had her mind set to the task, a blank sheet of paper set out in front of her. She knew exactly what she wanted to say, and yet the words just wouldn't come. She tried so many things to get the block to budge, walking around outside, greeting her friends, going to visit Rainbow Dash despite the mayor's protests, even reading some pony else's words, but nothing seemed to work. So now she sat, with so many words and nothing to write. On her last breaths, she resorted to her last resort, something she promised herself she'd never do, write a clop fic. The faint niggle of an idea graced Twilight's mind, her eyes lit and the quill set to motion, it scratched loudly against the rough, sketching out the first words of her grand plan. Clover Frost walked out and she stopped. The quill lifted up from the page and she read back through what she'd just written, then quickly scribbled an amendment. Clover Frost, the handsome, walked, scratched that, trudged out through the open snow. A smile spread across Twilight's muzzle. She liked that, but it needed more. She wrote another sentence. Clover Frost, the handsome, known such for he was the most handsome of all stallions, trudged through the open snow with his stallion hood whoop. No, Twilight frantically scratched out the last word, her blush intensifying. She didn't want it to start out like that. She tried again. Clover Frost, the handsome, known only as such for being the most handsome of all stallions, trudged through the open flap and into the warm inside of the... the tent? Twilight shrugged. Might as well be. Of the tent. And then she got stuck. Twilight pressed her quill into the ink pot, thinking to herself as she let it soak to the shaft. There has to be a better way of doing this, she frowned. 
with the quill freshly filled twilight scrunched up the page and tossed it aside sending it flying across her bedroom and on top of a pile of similar scraps of paper all her previous attempts the wad of paper tumbled off the top rolling all the way down the mountain and sliding to a halt at the base just beside the still empty waste basket ignoring the mess behind her twilight levitated a new page down in front of her and began scribbling anew clover frost also known as the strongest and most well hung stallion alive trudged through the howling wilderness of the frozen north he shivered pulling his close close to him and pressed on ahead he was intent on getting to his destination a brown tent on the horizon where his lover trot scratch that sunlight once again twilight found herself frozen unable to think of a single word what the hay rhymes with sparkle after a brief moment of contemplation twilight shrugged and pushed on his lover sunlight sparkled the wind was whipping past his mane blowing it into a thunderous uproar but he referred to stop for his erect another pause as twilight's blush returned in full force she cast a glance around the empty and darkened bedroom her eyes settling on spite's basket at the back where the tiny drake still snored she sighed waving herself with a hoof and skipped ahead in her tail slightly sunlight sparkles sat on the edge of her bed playing with her toys when her beloved came waltzing into the tent my lover he proclaimed twilight pushed on intent on making something of this my lovely lover dover smoopy doopy bear she choked feeling a slight bit of bile itching at the back of her throat she tossed the page away to begin again and again twilight found herself stuck she sighed dripping the quill in its ink pot despite it not needing it and began scribbling her ideas sunlight sparkles sat at the edge of her bed the sheets draped over her body and staring with a seductive smirk as she awaited her lover clover the clever scratch that frost strode into the tent letting the flap swing closed behind him and into the warmth therein he the sounds of hoof steps reached twilight's ears and she stopped cold her eyes bolted up to the closed door of her bedroom and she held on to her breath she waited for what felt like ages watching as a shadow lurked beyond the door frame she waited sweats dripping down in muscle and watched as the shadow continued clumping down the passage and out of earshot when she was finally sure she was alone twilight let out her held breath and turned back to a page he removed his hoof stitched brown cloth cloak the very same thing that hung exactly 13 millimeters from the ground on a normal pony but at a more meager 12 millimeters due to clover's reduced stature he levitated it over to the hook flashing a sultry smirk to the mare stretched out before him and let the cloak fall short twilight felt a slight shiver of guilt run up her spine just the thought of a stallion purposefully misplacing his coat and leaving it lying on the ground of all places where some pony might stump on it or even trip it struck a special type of cord for the princess clover skulked slyly over to his mistress she turning over and presenting her Ugh twilight groaned and scratched that out and began again clover sculped over to his mistress a sly grin upon his muzzle and draping the leash behind him in his twilight stopped again am i she stared with wide eyes at the page where did i she probably tore it up burned it to ashes and sent the remains to a decade-long banishment on the other side of the sun she wiped her hoof over her mane straightening out the odd split ends and then pushed her wings back down to lie smooth against her back when she was sure she was okay she pulled out another page and started again clover frost the handsome known as such for his perfectly manicured hooves and chiseled visage strode into the tent to welcome his beloved he strode with confidence 
flashing a sly grin as his eyes set firm on the target of his desire. Sunlight sparkle, he cooed. How unfortunate that we could find each other lost here, in the frigid tundra of the frozen north. A brief moment, and then he added, alone. With a wobble of his eyebrows, Clover Frost removed his satin leather cloak and levitated it over to the hook beside him. Sunlight Sparkle simply watched from her seat on the double princess bed as Clover held up his cloak to the hook and let it drop short. A slight bristle rang up Starlight's back, a slight shiver at the sight of the fabric tumbling to the ground before her. Then her eyes, growing wide, followed the curves of the castellion standing beside her. Her mouth hangs agape, wonder befalling her as she beheld his massive... What are you writing? Ah! Twilight screamed, almost falling out of her seat. She threw herself forward, attempting to cover her page from any intruding eyes. Nothing, nothing! She screamed and looked up to find Spike leaning over the front of her desk and staring at her with a raised eyebrow. The two sat there for a long moment, Twilight's grin growing extra wide and her blush deepening while Spike's eyebrow simply rose higher and higher. At length, Spike spoke. Okay, Twy, sheesh. He shrugged and backed down. I just came to tell you breakfast was ready. Twilight Sparkle is still trying to write a clopfic by Solace. After a brief break for breakfast, we return to Twilight Sparkle in the privacy of her own room. She sat crouched in front of her tiny desk, a toothbrush clenched in her teeth, dripping foam into her lap, and a brown and creased page held out between her hooves. Behind her and all around, the piles of crumpled papers and discarded ideas floated aimlessly in Twilight's aura, forgotten after all attention was turned to this one page. Hmm, she frowned and levitated the toothbrush away from her mouth. This is terrible. It was true, of course. She had barely filled half the scroll, and what she had was rampant with scribbles, crossed out words, and the tears of desperation. If there was any one single truth about Twilight Sparkle, it was that she shouldn't try to write when she was tired. But she'd gotten this far, it only made sense that she finished what she started. Thus, Twilight carefully set the page down at the corner of her desk, pulled out a clean one, then dipped her quill in the pot of ink and set to work. Clover Frost, my beloved, Sunlight Sparkle creamed. She almost rolled out of her bed upon seeing her beloved stallion step into the tent. The heat of the moment, that luscious swagger of his hips, she could... Spike! Starlight's angry voice sounded from up the hall, echoing loudly through the castle and shattering Twilight's concentration. There was the resounding thundering roll of a million little pieces of paper hitting the ground behind her. The quill jerked aside, snapped in two, and etched a large, deep black ink stain across the page, and Twilight collapsed to the ground, face first, into a sea of crumpled notes. I'm coming, Starlight! Spike's voice answered from outside, and as Twilight picked herself up, she heard the silent padding of dragon feet outside. Spike ran past her room, at a moderately above walking pace with a grimace on his face, waddling as fast as his legs would carry him in the direction of Starlight's angry yells. Twilight sighed and face hoofed. Are you serious? She groaned into her hoof and stood up, clearing a path through the papers with her magic, stormed to the door and slammed it shut, then returned to her desk to continue writing. She crumpled up the ruined page and threw it over her shoulder, adding it to the sea of papers gathering around her hooves, and pulled out another clean sheet and quill from her drawer. Clover Frost, my beloved! Sunlight Sparkle was ecstatic. She rolled over onto her back and took her loved between her hooves as he came in for a kiss. I missed you so much. It feels like you've been gone for eons, she cooed, and then they kissed. Twilight paused to think, making a mental checklist of what she needed. She had the setup, check. She had the character and the saucy dialogue, double check. All she needed was the... Twilight blushed a deep red. 
Okay, okay. She took a deep breath, shook herself off, and bought herself some time by dripping her quill in the ink. Whilst ensuring it was thoroughly soaked, Twilight forced herself to remain focused and ignored her wings as they extended behind her all on their own. She needed the saucy bits. She took another deep breath, pushed back her mane, and leaned into writing the next scene. They kissed long and hard, their breaths panting. Oh, Twilight, Clover Frost moaned. He pushed her onto the bed, and then he... And then he realised something. We can't do this! Clover pushed away, his chiselled chin sparkling the candlelight of the tent. Why, my beloved? Sunlight was disappointed. It's not perfect! He sat up beside Sunlight, throwing a hoof across the near bare tent. Save for a lone trunk, the coat rack, and Clover's cloak as previously stated, the thundering roar of the ice storm outside filled the room. This tent is a mess, and I can't love you without the enriching smell of literature to fill my nose. Twilight beamed. It was perfect. Everything she could have wanted from an erotic work of fiction. The strong, loving, sympathetic, yet academically inclined stallion, and the smart and talented unicorn mare, lucky enough to find herself draped between his hooves. She could see the scene playing out, as it were, right now. Clover Frost, his rippling physique, sparkling in the light, holding sunlight with his hooves around her barrel, and the golden glow of his horn, as he enticed her with melodious and eloquent words of William Shakespeare. His smooth, deep voice would lull her into a sense of relaxation as he recounted the historical prominence of the author's writings and the reflection of the times they embodied. And then, when she least expected it, he would run his hoof down her barrel, over her flank, and onto her... Twilight's head dipped, her horn brushing past the end of her quill on its way to the table. It hit with a resounding smack and Twilight bolted upright, wide awake. She looked around frantically, her eyes darting to the quarters. She turned forwards again and realised she'd been drooling, brought a hoof up to wipe the spittle away from her fetlock, then looked over the page. It was almost three quarters full, with a few droplets of spittle staining the bottom edge of the page and a large mark etching off from the last word where Twilight had fallen asleep. She'd gotten off on a horrible tangent, but she was sure she could still save it. Thus, after wiping away the extra ink and ensure her desk wouldn't be permanently damaged, she leaned back to her work. Oh, Clover, the... Scratch that. Frost, sunlight beamed. Make love to me like Romario did to his beloved. Scratch that. She begged, aching for him. I will, my bean of sunlight in the twilight, like the millions of stallions who... Changing her mind, Twilight quickly scratched out the last few words and pulled in her seat to sit more comfortably. Once she was sure she was close enough to the desk that there were no more papers shuffling at her hooves, the quill's movements resumed. Like a million stallions who could not, and then they kissed again, and in their flurried motions against each other, Sunlight lit her horn and summoned a frilled silken cotton saddle to wrap around her barrel, the bark straps flapping freely at her sides against Clover's hooves. He leaned into his beloved and... The quill froze, motionless, inches off the page. Twilight's brow furrowed as she fought for the right words. And... Still nothing. Um, Twilight clicked her tongue and pulled the quill closer to Bush against her face, as she thought. Her mind had suddenly drawn a blank. She knew what she wanted to do, where the story would go, but she couldn't for the life of her find the right words to describe it. It was like the... Oh no! Twilight gasped under her breath and pressed her hooves, came up to press against her forehead. It can't be! She groaned into her hooves and began rubbing her temples, she couldn't have writer's block again, and write when it was getting good, too. So she had to write something, anything. The quill trembled as Twilight's magic brought it back down to the page. She began racking her brains, 
trying not to focus on the page, but rather what she was trying to do. And they, she knew what she had to do, what she wanted, but she just couldn't. And they scratched that. Then he, there was a loud rap on the door and Twilight's concentration shattered as she spun around, flipping her page face down with a flash of her horn and looked directly at its handle as she heard mumblings from outside. Two voices argued, muffled by the thick wood. Outside, Starlight, wait! Spike's voice yelped suddenly, and something hard collided with the door, making it shudder. There was another bumping, the thud of something rolling to the ground, and the door burst inwards. I'm sorry, Spike! Starlight shouted over her shoulder, a stack of papers towering above her head as she trotted into the room. But this can't wait! She waded her way into the sea of crumpled pieces to Twilight's desk, ignoring the princess's preeminent meltdown. I don't care how busy Twilight is. If you're not going to help me, then I have no choice but to go to her. Twilight was almost knocked aside as the stack of papers levitated up past her and set themselves down with a loud slam in the middle of the desk, rattling it knocking Twilight's quill to the ground and thoroughly burying her previous work beneath the mountain. What? Twilight did a double take, glancing on Starlight to Spike as he waddled into the room at the back, panting loudly and rubbing a large bump in the middle of his forehead. She turned then to the pile of papers towering in front of her. What are these? She levitated a trio from the top of the stack reading the titles as they drifted past her face. Equestrian Labour Act of 1405, Mind Control Labour Relations Act of 1309, Equality Inequality Divisions Act of 802, No Time to Explain. Starlight shook her head, levitated Twilight's quill up from the floor, and shoved it into her face. I need these documents signed by a princess right away. I, uh, told you, Starlight. Spike huffed out of his breath as he ran up beside Starlight, holding up his arms and standing between her and Twilight. Twilight can't! He wobbled on his feet and leaned against his shins to try to regain his breath. She doesn't, he huffed. She doesn't have the authority to. Then send it to Princess Celestia! Starlight glimmer! Twilight shot up from her seat, snatching the quill from her student and staring her down. I'm not going to do anything until you tell me what's going on. And she motioned to her desk. What all of this? Please, Twilight. Starlight screamed and threw herself at Twilight's hooves, surprising the princess as she grabbed onto her fetlocks and looking up to her with tears in her eyes. These are legal documents. If I don't get them signed by a princess right now, I might have to go to jail. But Twilight's eyes went wide and she glanced to where Spike was, standing beside the desk and looking on with concern. She patted Starlight's mane and grabbed her hoof to pull her up. Fine, Twilight relented. She really wasn't in the mood to be dealing with any of this. Not now, not ever. She pointed Spike over to the desk. Spike, send them to Princess Celestia. But, no buts. Okay. Spike sighed and stepped close to the desk. Both Twilight and Starlight moved aside to let him work. Spike stood aside the desk for a short moment, taking deep breaths, until he finally heaved a sigh and blew his flame across the papers. The entire pile immediately went up in flames, a golden magic enveloping them from Spike's side to the far side and evaporating the piled into golden whips that twisted their way up, out the window, and on their way to Canterlot. With the job done, Starlight relaxed. She squeezed Twilight in a tight hug, thanking her as many times as she could as soon as they were both gone. Alone and left to her own devices, Twilight took a deep breath as she made her way back to her empty desk, brushing the papers across the floor and pulling them neatly into a corner on her way. In a way, she was actually grateful for the interruption. The block was gone and she was itching with anticipation to continue her writing. She dropped down in her seat, levitated her quill up from the floor, pulled her chair in and went pale, frozen, 
as she set eyes on her desk. The desk was empty. Realization slowly dawned on Twilight, her eyes widening as they refused to tear themselves away, a look of horror taking hold. Empty desk. The words echoed through her mind. Empty desk. Her heart pounding in her ears, her stomach dropping through the floor. Every second her mind went through the same actions and the implications it held. Empty desk. She flipped the desk. Mother fu- A thousand years later. Written and composed by Dio Brando. Dear, dear friends of mine, I'm writing this to you not because I think you will receive it. Somewhere in my heart I want to believe that you will. I know, however, that what's done is done. In this long time that I have taught so many the value of friendship, there is still one lesson I have yet to learn for myself, and that is how to deal with its loss. Yet I shan't focus on that which is inevitable. I shan't focus on that which cannot be changed. It is a process of life, ironically. A cycle must come to an end to start anew. However, my beloved friends, I never thought, not then and not now, that I would truly have to endure for so many years the pain of losing all of you. In order to settle this in my broken heart once more, I shall write to you, to all of you. This letter, which you shall perhaps never read, is all of my love towards you, to bring together the memories we shared, our best moments, and to bring forth the good in all that you ever were and are to me today. Rainbow Dash, you were as loyal a friend as any, and even more. I remember hearing the crackling across the sky, seeing that burst of colour rushing over the horizon from when you performed what ponies thought to be impossible. Your daring attitude and your competitive nature would have seemed by some to be bothersome, but I saw the spirit of a friend who would do anything to keep her loved ones at the top. Someone who wouldn't turn down a challenge, no matter how difficult, because their friends relied on them to complete it. I saw in you, not arrogance, but a true heart. Pride, not in yourself, but in the ponies you surrounded yourself with. It was that pride that made you so important to us all, that showed us it was okay to brag on those you loved. You taught us loyalty to one another, and you brought to us those traits that no one else could have perfectly exemplified but you. I wish not to have known you for a single day less, yet even now I would give everything for even a day more with any of you. Rainbow Dash, you taught me loyalty, and I will never forget the promise I made to you on that day, to never let my friends down, even though things might be tough. Rarity, you were the most generous of us all. I will never forget the many times you sacrificed your look, your time, your money and your efforts to help me and all of us out of any scenario we faced. You never batted an eye to it. Not once did you ever think twice to give to those you held so dearly. You showed us what generosity was. And of all the things you gave, your heart was the most valuable. Every time you helped another out with what you had, you showed us how to use what we have earned, not just for ourselves, but for others to give to those less fortunate than us, that they might give to others as well. You could have pursued a path that would have given you everything, that would have kept everything to you, but you sacrificed everything for what you and all of us believed was more important, your friends. You realised that, truly, the love of your friends was everything, and that, perhaps, it wasn't even a sacrifice to you. You put your friends above yourself, and you gave to them what you would have wanted. Thus we gave back, and so did every pony you had ever helped. The tears from your eyes as you laid on that bed, seeing all the ponies that you selflessly gave to coming to you to give back, was perhaps the most heartbreaking moment of your passing. It was sad to see a pony like you leave, but your impact has outlasted this long time. 
Your legacy has continued as all of our friends have. Rarity, you taught me generosity and I will never forget the promise I made to you on that day to give generously to those in need, even if I feel like I need it more. Applejack, you were the most honest of us all. I will never forget the times you told me the truth, regardless of whether it made me feel bad or not. But I could see, feel and understand your loving tone, that you wanted better for me, even if it meant pointing out my flaws. You were honest with all of us, never letting the worst of us go free. You always stopped it in its tracks. You were never condescending. You never saw us lower than yourself. Honesty was your gift, not just because you could tell a brutal truth, but because you could do so in such a way that we knew you wanted and expected the best out of us, and thus we did the same for you. You always worked hard and never cheated out of any situations when helping others out. Your honesty was more than words, it was your heart, and I never doubted you. Because of you, I have taught ponies for so many years the way to speak honest words, while still loving, to deal with those difficult scenarios, while also lifting ponies up. Applejack, you taught me honesty, and I will never forget the promise I made to you on that day, to speak truth and to speak love, so that every pony could reach their highest potential. Fluttershy, you were the kindest of us all. I will never forget how you put every pony before yourself, how your soft voice comforted so many souls who were in such need of it. For me, you were my hope of dealing with daily stresses. When I was down, you lifted me up. You did that for all of us and everyone you meet. You left no pony out, making sure that every pony within your reach had even a touch of kindness to keep going that day. You always knew when someone was feeling left out when they were sad or angry or stressed. You always knew how to fix it. You were not blindly nice, but you had the empathy for every pony that seemed so hard to have in a time like this. Yet, no matter how terrible you felt, you always found it in your heart to derive your joy from giving it to another. Your warmth spread like fire, showing all ponies how to be kind in a way that did more than bring a fake smile. Fluttershy, you taught me kindness, and I will never forget the promise I made to you on that day, to be the warmth that ponies seek, to be the love that ponies need, because they all deserve it. Pink Amina, Diane Pye, you spread the most laughter of us all. I will never forget the times you brought smiles to our faces, regardless of how terrible we felt. You gave us, and especially myself, the strength to carry on in the most difficult circumstances. You always saw the bright side, and you never even let yourself stay sad, because you knew your friends counted on you to bring them the light of a bright smile. Because of you, we all knew how to bring joy in the darkest of times, when days were as black as night, when they were as cold as a harsh winter wind. Your smile was sometimes all that I knew I could look forward to. Even now, I would beg the goddesses to see your smile again. Even once, if only I could. Your joy outlasted your life. With all ponies who look up to you as an example, to bring laughter to the darkness, to see the good in everything. Pink Amina Diane Pye, you taught me laughter, and I will never forget the promise I made to you on that day. To find joy in everything. To bring laughter in any scenario because it truly was the best medicine. I reflect on so many memories of all of you, more than I can write, but the most burdensome memories to my thoughts are those promises I made to you. That which you have taught me, have I truly retained? Rainbow Dash, I promised I would be loyal, but I have none to be loyal to. Rarity, I promised to be generous, but I have not found it in my heart that I could give anything as I have so little to give. Applejack, I promise to be honest, but can I truly be honest if all I have to say is grim? Fluttershy, I promise to be kind, but I cannot find it in my heart to even lift my head to those I serve as princess. Pinkie Pie, I promise to have joy, but yet I have nothing but sadness. Do I even have the friends I used to? 
Since losing all of you, have I ever made more? Would that be replacing you? Would it be wrong? Or is it more that I have made these promises to my friends, who are dead, and have broken them? Have I truly let all five of you, my dearest friends, whom I mourn for day after day, down after all this time? I have written this letter 365,000 times. Every night, I cannot bear but to write this letter. Yet, what does it do but reflect my mourning? I do not know if I can take it. I miss all of you so much. Why can't you come back? Why can't... Twilight threw the paper towards the wall, burying her face in the pillow beside her throne, sobbing. It had been a thousand years, and she had not felt any different, nor had she once kept the promises she made. She did not know how much longer she could take it, or if she should just put an end to... Her sobbing stopped. She looked up at the door. Why were her guards waking her up this early? She used her magic to open the door, seeing a small filly from one of her friendship classes holding a letter. Twilight could see that she was shivering. Dear child, please come in, Twilight said quietly. Why are you up so late? How did you get past the... Oh, never mind that. What has brought you here? The child walked towards Twilight's bed quietly, looking to the floor nervously before placing the small paper onto it. It was a poorly folded envelope with some crayon writing on it. M Miss Twilight, you taught us today about helping our friends out when they were sad. She said quietly. And you look sad, so I wanted to help you. Twilight blinked, looking down at the card and reading it. Dear Princess Twilight, we want you to know that we all love you very, very much, and we are all your friends. Love. Beneath the closing of the small letter was written the name of every classmate of that class, all children who perhaps didn't have a clue what the stress of death was like. A drop of water stained the paper, as it had brought Twilight to tears once more, but this time she was smiling. She gave the filly a warm, tight hug closing her eyes tightly as she swore. For just a moment she could feel her friends smiling at her from above. Dear, dear friends of mine, I see now that it is not wrong to let go of death, because in the process of holding onto your deaths, I have let go of your lives. This filly, who perhaps does not know of these complications, has come to me to teach me the most valuable lesson of all. Friendship does not end with death. Friendship continues on for the living. Not one more day will I break these promises I have made to you. I swear. Thank you for everything, my beloved friends. Love, Twilight Sparkle. Flex Tape Fixes Equestria by The Drider Pony Arcane lightning hissed and spit, arcing between crystal pylons as it tore asunder the boundaries between two worlds. With significantly less fanfare, a small object plopped through the hole and rolled a few feet away, coming to a stop against a lavender hoof. On occasion, Princess Twilight's portal to the human dimension spat out various objects without ceremony or warning. Twilight was convinced that these were samples discreetly sent by either Sunset Shimmer or her own human counterpart for scientific study and analysis. Organic samples to compare with their equestrian counterparts or sometimes Earth-exclusive materials for her to perform magic analysis on. She did so diligently, despite Spike's complaints. He was of the opinion that some human, his bits were on either Rainbow Dash or Pinkie Pie, was just using the portal as a convenient garbage bin for their lunch leftovers and whatever other trash happened to be in their pockets at the time. 
but this new object fell into neither category. Twilight picked it up with her magic and rotated it curiously. It was a thick roll containing many layers of some reflective rubberized material. It was also still shrink-wrapped in its original packaging, which allowed her to easily dismiss Spike's nonsense. Lazy trash theory. It bore a colourful inscription, but without the portal's imbued translation magic, it was indecipherable. She began to walk back to the kitchen where she'd previously been enjoying a lazy brunch before being interrupted by the sound of the portal opening. Anything interesting today? Spike asked as she entered the kitchen, his mouth filled with a spoonful of ruby O's. Really, they were just gemstone beads that had failed to pass Rarity's exacting standards. Not that he hadn't considered the branding potential of a gemstone cereal. I'm not sure. Twilight floated the roll across the table. The writing didn't translate. Flex tape, Spike read immediately. Strong rubberized adhesive tape, super strong, sticks to any surface, even underwater. New patented formula for extra hold. He tossed it back. Neat, looks useful. Could I borrow some of that actually? There's a leak in my towel that's been keeping me up. Twilight hummed thoughtfully. We should probably test it on some smaller applications first. There's no guarantee that they had the materials of another world in mind when they said that it sticks to any surface. Without a moment's hesitation, Spike took a mostly empty spoonful of gem cereal and bit down. Hard. A louder than average cracking noise heralded a clinking cacophony as he spit his spoon back onto the table in three parts. There you go. Spike! Twilight exclaimed, what in the world did you do that for? What? He replied innocently. You said we needed something small to test it on. I meant something that was already broken. Now we're going to be a spoon short the next time we have company. It's not like it really even matters. Spike grumbled huffily. The castle just makes more. Twilight paused. What's that now? He nodded. Yeah, one night I came down for a midnight snack and I was really out of it and ate through like five forks and a butter tray before I realised what I was doing. Next day, I checked the drawer, and we had a complete set again. Huh. Odd. I did not know it could do that. Not the most eloquent of responses, but it conveyed her reaction accurately. But we can study the castle's features another time. Let's focus on one thing for now. Spike grabbed the tape and after getting his claws under the almost flush edge, pulled off a long strip. The flex tape made a strange noise as adhesive parted from rubber, similar to paper ripping, but it also produced a strangely elongated tone that changed pitch the longer he pulled on it like some peculiar instrument. Spike paused as his ear fins twitched. That just sent the weirdest tingle down the back of my neck. Twilight nodded, folding her ears back to hide the fact that they too had strung up to attention at the sound. It was oddly satisfying, to say the least. Continuing where he had left off, Spike took the strip and wrapped it around the spoon, binding the shattered handle pieces as tightly as he could. When he finished, it looked identical to the rest of the cutlery set save for its new black handle. He gave it a tap. Hey, what do you know? It holds up. He gave the spoon an experimental tug, followed by a stronger one. That's, uh, really strong, actually. Twilight took the repaired spoon from him with her magic as she brought it in for closer observation. Although not immediately visible, her magic was also applying twists, tension, and pressure to the spoon from all manner of angles. You're right, it's as strong as any repair spell I know of. She tossed it back once more. Could you apply a bit of fire to it? I'm curious as to its heat tolerance. Spike shrugged and engulfed it in a blaze of flame. Not that much. Much to her surprise, it was entirely not enough. As the light from the fire faded and dimmed, she could clearly see how the bowl of the spoon was shiny and sagging, melted by the sheer heat of the dragon fire. The handle, however, looked untouched. Spike touched it. It's not even hot. I believe this calls for more extensive testing. Twilight levitated Spike to her back 
and the remaining roll of flex tape to his hand. Where did you say there was a leak? My room, he reminded. With a quick flash of light, they found themselves by the foot of his bed. Spike hopped off Twilight's back as she began scanning the ceiling. All right, where is it? He pointed to the far corner. It was faint, but one could just make out a long, thin crack above the window. Twilight nodded in understanding. Pull me another strip. Spike ripped off another piece, and once again the air was punctuated by that same drawling note. The pair shuddered slightly, each too preoccupied, trying to hide their own reaction to notice that the other was doing the same. With a few beats of her wings, Twilight was airborne. She approached the crack at speed, flex tape in hoof, putting a bit of spin on her ascent. She pulled back a foreleg and slammed the flex tape onto the ceiling with a satisfying smack. She descended slowly, admiring her efforts as she reached the ground. You know, Spike, I never thought that repairing things could be so cathartic. Spike nodded in agreement. Even if he hadn't been the one to do it himself, the flex tape made so many ear-pleasing sounds that even repairing vicariously had its thrill. If only there were more things to fix. You know, he started, I think I remember Starlight saying that one of the pipes in her shower was leaky. Twilight's eyes lit up, followed quickly by her horn. With a flash, they were gone again. Let me give it a go this time, Spike insisted as they arrived in Starlight's bathroom. You got it. He took a strip in his claw after another moment of fascinating ripping music and hopped between ledges before he was finally high enough to reach the shower head. With a long jump and a dramatic hya, he landed the flex tape on the pipe with yet another delightful smacking noise. Twilight laughed and cheered him on. Slap it on, Spike, slap it on! He did so with wild abandon, adding another three layers for an especially strong seal. You were right, Twilight, that felt good. What else can we fix around here? After a moment of silent consideration, an unsettling grin grew between the pair before they vanished in another flash of teleportation magic. Twilight, Spike, I'm back from the Crystal Empire. Starlight Glimmer called as she pushed open the doors to Castle Friendship. It had been a nice visit, but the Crystal Pony still had a few peculiar anachronistic habits that made her long for the reliable normalcy of the castle and township she'd come to call home. But if only she'd chosen to return at any other time, she might have also been greeted by some of that reliable normalcy. As it was, the foyer of the castle was far from normal. Strips of strange black material marred the decor. They were wrapped around table legs, pressed flush around corners, and slapped at some angle or another on almost every flat surface. A few thin strands dangled objects from the grand chandelier, holding aloft vases and knick-knacks that seemed far too heavy to be supported by so little. Even the large spider web crack above the door, courtesy of Rainbow Dash and a bottle of cider, and a dare made in jest, had been patched up by an equally large spider web of black strips. Had something happened? Had there been some sort of attack? Some kind of viral crystal contagion? Twilight! She called again, louder this time as concern coloured her voice. Starlight! But the reply she heard in return was surprisingly chipper. With a flash of light, Twilight teleported into the foyer, wearing an elated grin that bordered on manic. I'm so glad you're home. I have so much to show you. Twilight, what? What is all this? This? Twilight grinned. Why, it's only the greatest thing since Star Swirl invented self-slicing bread. She held up a hoof upon which dangled a ring of the same black material like a comically oversized bracelet. It's flex tape. That's interesting. Starlight forced out. That was it. So Twilight had just decided to put tape on everything? Apparently. In most cases, that would be an obvious sign of mental instability. An inept, changeling replacement or magical corruption. 
but on the other hoof, the pony in question was Twilight, so... Oh, you better believe it is, Twilight cheered. Flex tape can fix anything. She leaned in close, so close that Starlight's bubble of personal space became atomically close to her skin. Anything. Well, not anything, I'm sure. Starlight chuckled nervously, falling for the obvious trap. There's obviously some things it can't fix. That's what I thought too, but oh how wrong I was. Twilight hopped back, thankfully giving Starlight room to breathe once more. I have fixed every hole, patched every leak, and repaired every iota of damage that has ever been done to this castle, inside and out. I made a boat out of old newspapers and covered it in flex tape, and the Crusaders have been sailing Ponyville Lake in it all day. It even fixed Twilight's bad attitude about me flex taping everything in her guest room. She raised the accessorized foreleg. And the roll just doesn't run out. Wait, what was that last one? Starlight interrupted. I haven't heard any complaints from her since, or anything at all for that matter. And watch this. Twilight shot a bolt of magic at a patch on the wall, then quickly stepped back. The magic ball bounced off the flex tape like a mirror, then off another and another and another crisscrossing the hall and it passed Twilight and hit the first piece again to complete a circuit. Perfect magical reflectivity. I made a perpetual magic machine. Starlight blinked. That was impressive. Undeniably a feat of magical prowess and engineering. But there were bigger issues at Hoof. Even for Twilight, this seemed beyond her normal mania. And there was still that thing with Trixie that she needed somewhat urgent clarification on. But before she could pose a question, Twilight threw her for another loop. From somewhere in the intervening moments, Twilight had pulled out a cardboard box with a practically seamless black covering. She then proceeded to put said box over her head. Starlight! Starlight! She cried like a foal eager to show its mother a new trick. Try to read my mind! This was all getting to be too much. Starlight could only stare at her dear friend, her teacher, and strictly speaking, her sovereign as she waited, rubber box on her head like a freakishly featureless mask, for Starlight to read her mind. Twilight? What? I can't. That's right, you can't. The muffled voice replied. Perfect magic insulation as well, not a single leak. A knocking at the door interrupted their unusual conversation much to Starlight's relief. Tentatively, a grey head with a golden mane poked in through the door that Starlight had left open. Hello? Any pony in? I have a package for Princess Twilight. Twilight gasped in delight as she cast aside her cardboard casquet. Derpy! Oh, this is a perfect opportunity! Come in! Come in! She took hold of the surprise Pegasus in a magic pulling pony package and all into her foil. You're just in time to help me show Starlight something. Hi, Derpy, Starlight greeted meekly. Hello, Starlight, the male mare replied, but something about the greeting seemed oddly forced. I'm actually kind of busy today, Twilight, so if you could just sign... Right, sorry, Twilight apologised quickly, signing her name on Derpy's clipboard with the proffered quill. Really though, it'll take a second, literally a second. The wall-eyed mare gave a wall-eyed stare to the wall-eyed princess and the unhinged hair. She eyed the package nervously. I really should be going. Busy, busy, busy. She turned to leave, only to be interrupted. Wait, isn't the post office closed on the weekend? Twilight asked. Derpy froze before slowly turning to face the unicorn. Yes, she said tersely. But there were a few packages that were misplaced yesterday, so I'm delivering them now. Twilight smiled. What a thoughtful thing to do. Starlight took a different view. Are you getting overtime for this, or is this out of your personal hours? Overtime, she replied quickly, as if the other had never even been an option worth considering, or she just wanted to hurry the conversation along so she could leave. Well, it looks like this is your last package, there's no harm in waiting a few extra minutes to run the clock and earn a couple extra bits. Questionable workplace ethics aside, Starlight 
really just desperately wanted a supportive voice of reason to help her bring Twilight down from this flex tape high. Derpy's eyes darted back and forth between the door, Starlight and the package still held in Twilight's hooves. No, no, I really should be... Oh, just hold still, Twilight said, puffing in exasperation. This won't hurt a bit and you'll thank me later. With a sudden ripping noise, a strip of black flex tape found itself latched to the patch of fur between Derpy's eyes. There, Twilight grinned in self-satisfaction. Now that wasn't so bad, was it? But she was cut off by the sound of panic screaming. Derpy's eyes went wide as saucers as she scrabbled at her face in panic. Starlight started to step in to help, only to jump back in alarm as Derpy's face suddenly caught fire. Flames consumed her body in an instant, burning away fur and uniform alike, and leaving behind nothing but pitted black tissue. But burned skin was never so smooth, nor did fire usually cause a pony to grow a horn or double in height. In moments, the friendly face of Ponyville's iconic delivery mare was gone, replaced by the horrifying and intimidating stature of Chrysalis, Queen of the Changeling Empire. Or rather, it would have been intimidating if Chrysalis, Queen of the Changeling Empire, were not rolling around on the floor like a foal, with chicken pox screaming, Get it off! Get it off! Get it off! Alarmed, but still thinking clearly, Starlight charged up her horn with an offensive spell, except Twilight reacted even faster. Before Starlight could even properly charge her spell, Chrysalis was fastened to the wall. A piece of flex tape adhered securely across each limb and one wrapped around her horn. Gah! Get it off! She continued to shriek. I can't stand having things stuck to my chitin! Starlight rolled her eyes at the dramatics, but clearly nothing was going to progress until she complied. With a swift tug, the strip peeled off the changeling's face leaving behind a patch of slightly lighter chitin. Finally! Chrysalis sighed in relief before glaring at Starlight. Don't think this changes anything between us. At best you've earned a slightly swifter death when the time comes. Starlight rolled her eyes as the Queen shifted her sneer to the Alicorn Princess. Twilight Sparkle, how easily you've fallen into my trap. Your day of reckoning is at hoof! Twilight raised an unimpressed eyebrow. Seems to me like you're the one who is trapped. Ha! A minor setback. But you were still the fool who let a pony into your castle, unchecked and uncontested. Your naivety is your undoing. Twilight poured the box which had fallen to the wayside during the confusion. And I suppose part of your plan involved me opening this then. It, Chrysalis faltered, her expression of smug superiority slipped off as she mumbled over her words. Wait, no, that line won't make sense if I'm still here. Maybe if I skip ahead towards the end a bit. Her eyes widened suddenly in a moment of true panic. Oh, sweet queen prime in the sky, I'm still here. She glanced up only to see that twilight was almost through the outermost layers of wrapping. Stop, the changeling demanded. If you value the lives of everyone in this castle, you will not open that package. Twilight hesitated. That was certainly a grave threat, an order of magnitude more violent than the queen's usual rhetoric. On the other hoof, Chrysalis was completely immobile and effectively a hostage herself. Plus Starlight was nearby and more than capable enough to undo any spells or magic effects. And if all else failed, she still had her flex tape. Against Chrysalis's continued protests, she opened the box. Twilight blinked at the ticking bundle of wires and crystals. A bomb? She turned to the captured queen. You really are running out of ideas, aren't you? This isn't the time for that, you fool! Chrysalis hissed as she fought uselessly against her bonds. Release me before we're all blown to kingdom come, and there's no way to disarm it now that it's been activated. Hmm. Twilight spun the bomb around, inspecting it surprisingly calmly, given the situation. Yes, you're quite right. This is expertly crafted. There's no way I could break or interfere with it without causing it to go off prematurely. She pinged it with her magic, causing a momentary ripple of magenta light. Anti-teleportation wards as well. Nice touch. Exactly! Now unbind me this instant! Yes, there is absolutely no way to disable this bomb, Twilight mused. But what if... 
What if I didn't need to break it? What if I fixed it instead? With a speed that rivaled even Pinky's present wrapping abilities, she swiftly swaddled the entire bomb in flex tape, then added a second layer for good measure. Not that it needed it. It's no use! Chrysalis cried, almost sobbing now at the inevitability of her fate. There's no force on Equus that could contain that blast. Oh, sweet over queen, take me now. With an anticlimactic whoop, the tape bulged and flexed for a moment before returning to its original shape. Not even a wisp of smoke escaped its perfect binding. Ah, uh, well. Chrysalis coughed awkwardly, trying to quickly move past her embarrassing display of weakness. Well then, Curse you, Sparkle! I shall have my revenge anon! The alicorn did not respond. Sparkle? Twilight turned her attention to her captive, but she did not see the Changeling Queen as Chrysalis arch villain towards Equestria, nor did she see her as an interloper who nearly ruined her brother's wedding. Not even did she acknowledge her as the creature who had just tried to blow her to smithereens. In fact, the only thing she really noticed about the Changeling was her legs. Her long princess-like legs, black and smooth as her beloved tape, and also full of holes. So many holes. That's a lot of damage, Twilight whispered. Sparkle? What are you doing, Sparkle? Twilight, get that away from me. You leave my holes alone. No, no, you'll ruin my queenly aesthetic. Don't worry, Chrysalis. Twilight shushed her with a silly smile on her face. Flex tape will fix that. Flex tape can fix anything! Warshipping at the Altar of Knowledge by TCC56 Chapter 1 Observe Gliding in low over the treetops, Twilight did her best to stay silent, alerting the crowd below would have grave consequences. A massive bonfire crackled in the middle of them, threatening to ruin her night vision while still casting the cluster of robed figures in flickering shadow. It had been rumours originally, quiet comments and the barest of murmurs. Official inquiries had only sent them deeper to ground. S-M-I-L-E assets had eventually teased out enough to find the location of this meeting, but little more. To stop the cult from gaining any more traction, they needed information. They needed to find out details. This wasn't a princess's job, the captain of the guard had said. I need to do something that isn't looking at tax law or I will throw several nobles into the sun, the princess had responded. I think that would be a good thing, had been his counterpoint. I could make you a baron first, had been hers. Which is why she was now coasting on the breeze to spy on a secretive and likely evil cult in the wild forest near Fole Mountain. Granted, there were two platoons of royal guards only a mile away and ready to pounce. But she was the one who was investigating and observing and not engaging, the captain had refused to give any ground on that one, the spoil sport. A low flying cloud provided the perfect perch for Twilight, letting her settle down within hearing range as the cultists gathered. Dark purple robes blended in with the shadowy forest around, eerily moving in the twilight before twilight. She was a bit late to the scene, they had already started. The one who stood alone at the northernmost point of the circle continued to speak. And so it shall be. Nothing and no pony shall impede our quest, our sacred duty. He waved a hoof in the air, motioning to the sky and coincidentally towards the hidden twilight. To open the mysteries of the universe itself and find the path to true magic. Around the fire, the others in purple echoed his words in a refrain. The, the path to true magic. magic! The secret knowledge shall not be held back from us, my friends. Those who would selfishly hoard it 
will bow before us at the altar of knowledge after they are shown the error of their ways. And the gathering once more echoed the words, The, the altar of knowledge. knowledge! Twilight's wings twitched. Oh no, they were the worst kind of evil cultists. Educated. This was bad. This was really bad. They read books, which meant they had the knowledge to get what they were after. They probably read the wrong books so they wouldn't be an evil cult. But Twilight could appreciate the wisdom of, and danger in, their attempts. The leader stomped a hoof against the hard ground. A chunk of slate was there, possibly placed for this exact purpose. The crack of hoof on stone echoed in the dark. Now let us begin tonight's work, my friends. I presume that you are all prepared. Above, Twilight braced. Each of the crowd of cultists pulled an object from their robe. Books. She could recognize that much in an instant, though the exact titles were a mystery. A part of Twilight screamed in panic that these obviously evil ponies might burn them. Another part screamed that the light was far too poor for proper reading and they would give themselves eye strain. There was a firm nod from the leader. Excellent! You may break into your study groups now, to your places! And the cult obeyed. The circle of ponies scattered, dissolving into eleven smaller clusters, six evenly spaced around the inside, five more on the outside in a lopsided manner. Twilight frowned at that. Something about that configuration was familiar. Before joining the last group, the leader spoke again. Everyone has a study partner before we begin reading? Yes? Good. None of you should study alone because... And as one, the group spoke a chilling refrain. Friendship, Friendship is, is magic. magic! Oh no! Those two words were the entirety of Twilight's thoughts. The rest of her brain was locked up in absolute terror. To the princess's credit, it only took her half a minute to pull herself out of it and into a panicked, dead sprint of deduction. The cult was arranged in eleven groups, a familiar six-pointed star with five smaller ones lopsidedly arranged around it. Deep purple robes, a dedication to knowledge and books. Twilight's mental gears jammed again as she attempted to process what had to be the truth. This was her cult! Or at least one dedicated to her, came the quick stream of mental justifications. She didn't start it and didn't control it, so she couldn't really say it was hers and... And Twilight clamped her eyes shut and counted to ten. She had to keep under control, and she needed time to gather her thoughts. With a quick burst of wind, the Princess of Friendship lifted away from the cloud and took to the air again. She thankfully wasn't seen and blessed silence covered her path all the way to the waiting royal guards. The leader of the detachment saluted as she landed. Ready to move in, your highness, just give the word. His response was thoughtful silence that lasted long enough for nervous unease to sink into the entire contingent. No, Twilight finally settled on. Not tonight, sergeant. She raised her head from her thoughts to meet his eyes. Have our people continue to keep an eye on the known members of this cult and watch their actions. Before any action is taken, I must consult some important sources of knowledge. A pause, then a quick addition. To make sure every pony is safe, I mean. I need to research something. The guards didn't look happy, but they understood orders. And as they turned to head home, Twilight took to the skies herself, not towards Canterlot but to Silver Shoals. Not many ponies in Equestria could give advice when it came to this. Fortunately, Twilight knew just where to find the most knowledgeable there was.
Chapter 2 Question It was technically correct that the former princesses of Equestria lived in Silver Shoals. The more descriptive statement would be that their retirement villa was inside the township of Silver Shoals, nestled between the shoreline and a steep hill. As she glided in, Twilight couldn't help but be reminded of Canterlot Castle and how the two-towered structure ahead looked just similar enough to evoke the original despite the vast differences in size. Location and building material. Finding Celestia was easy enough. Missing a massive alicorn sunning herself on the seaward deck would have required being blind. Rather than going to the front door and forcing Celestia to get up to answer it, Twilight simply landed beside her. The former Dyarch's ear twitched at the sound of hooves on wood, but she let Twilight close the gap. It was only when the younger Alicorn stood over her that she spoke. You're in my light. It's my light now, came the sassy reply, and both of them broke out into laughter. Celestia rose from the lounge chair, wrapping hooves and wings around her former student. Twilight, it's so good to see you. It hasn't been that long, but I've still missed you so. I missed you too, Twilight nuzzled her former teacher without even realising it. I know I should come around more often to visit, but... But duty calls, Celestia completed with a knowing smile. I believe I understand that burden. Twilight blushed. Speaking of burdens, I'm sorry to say that this isn't a social call either. I need to ask you and Luna for advice about something. Celestia pulled away from Twilight to turn inside. You may have to wait a few minutes then. Luna is currently out doing her rounds, but she's due back any time now. A bit of tea while we wait. Following, Twilight gave a small nod to affirm the question. Her rounds? Oh, did Luna become a doctor? No, no, it hasn't been long enough for her to finish the schooling. Maybe a nurse, though? There was a rather deep sigh from Celestia at that. No, Twilight, my sister is not a nurse. She's... The front door thumped open. Luna came barreling into the kitchen with a broad grin on her face and a dark brown uniform on her body. Sister, today was another glorious day in the... Oh, greetings, Twilight Sparkle. The Princess of Friendship stared for a moment. You're a male mare? Celestia's long and belaboured sigh confirmed it. Please don't ask questions. She's enthusiastic about answering them. Luna lofted her cap onto a hook, then stuck out her tongue at her sister. I'll join both of you in a minute. I just need to change out of my uniform. As the dark alicorn left, the other two turned back to the kitchen table. Celestia floated a plate of scones to the middle before starting the kettle. I should probably have asked before, Twilight, but how time sensitive is this matter? You didn't seem in a rush, but I know how affairs of state can be. No, not too much. Twilight lifted a scone in her aura, examining it. Apple cinnamon, and she knew the particular scent of Sweet Apple Acres Apple by heart at this point. A brief pang of nostalgia ran through her. From what S-M-I-L-E was able to figure out, there's another two weeks before the cult meets. Celestia spun around. Cult? Did you say cult? Twilight frowned deeply. Yes, I'm afraid. And it gets worse. They appear to be warshipping. She swallowed roughly. Voice full of shame. Me. Of all the reaction Twilight had been expecting, Celestia let out a Celestia letting out a cheerful whoop was not one of them, nor was the former princess shouting down the hall. Luna! Hurry up! Twilight has her first cult! The royal cantalot voice echoed down the hall. Huzzah! It is about time! What? Twilight stared gormlessly at her old mentor. This didn't make any sense. It took longer than we had expected, Celestia explained without actually explaining what Twilight cared about. Though, I suppose your area of rule is a bit less showy than ours was. Twilight blinked rapidly, trying to grasp what was going on. Wait, are you saying that you and Luna had cults? And that you expected I was going to have one too? Celestia laughed, 
As a parent laughs when their child first realizes that the parent had once been young too. Dear Twilight, if you don't have at least one every decade or two, you're probably doing something wrong. Before Twilight could question that further, Luna entered with a towel around her neck. So, have they yet begun sacrifices in the name of the Great Sparkle? You must give us details. Despite the vast number of wild and confused thoughts going through Twilight's head at that very moment, one of the more unlikely ones was what finally fought to the surface. Never call me that again, she tensely asked Luna. You make me sound like Trixie. The great and powerful Trixie, Luna helpfully corrected as she pulled a delicate pink teacup out of the cupboard. Twilight pursed her lips and her face went red, trying not to shout. Celestia broke out laughing again. Twilight, you really should relax. You seem to think that this is a terrible crisis. It's not. It is, in fact, entirely expected and natural. So I should just be fine with having a cult warshipping me? Letting them be and doing who knows what in my name? Twilight poured at the tile uneasily. She didn't like a bit of that thought. Oh no, you should crush them completely, answered Celestia, much to Twilight's continued confusion, as brutally and quickly as possible. Luna, who had picked up a scone in the meanwhile, snorted with loud derision. The two sisters appeared, about ready to argue, but Twilight interrupted them first. Can you two please start from the beginning? I'm completely lost here. I just found out there's a dark cult that worships me and reads books in the woods, and you're both excited? Luna, instead of helping, started to giggle. Reads books in the woods? That's so you. Celestia cut in before Twilight could work herself up worse. Setting that aside for the moment, the reason my sister and I are as relaxed about this as we are is because it's perfectly normal. Consider it from the average pony's perspective. We're immortal beings of unique appearance and with great enough magical power that we have control over celestial bodies and the forces of the cosmos. Is it any surprise that some ponies would see us as divine figures? In the old days, Luna said, sitting across from Twilight, when Equestria had just begun, it wasn't uncommon. We never encouraged such things, but nor did we shy away from it. By the time of my banishment, both of us had followers of a significant size. She paused before adding, as did Starswell. Quickly, Celestia interrupted with a correction. Starswell and I had a number of students who worshipped the ground we walked on, in the more traditional sense. Wizard groupies, Luna swarmily clarified. Twilight blushed and decided to look intently at her scone. Your idol's proclivity to collect swooning students aside, the worship of an alicorn was simply a thing that happened at the time. Until Nightmare Moon, Twilight half questioned. She had a guess about where this was going. Celestia nodded. Yes, until Nightmare Moon. Things went awkwardly silent only to be finally broken by the kettle. All three startled at the noise, but it was enough to shatter the somber introspection. Celestia lifted the kettle from a burner and continued. After the banishment, many of Luna's followers turned down a dark path. I tried for a time to steer them from it, but most would not be swayed. Just as with Luna, the good intentions and reasonable points behind their actions became twisted. The elder Salicorn paused, leaning over to hug her sister. Luna's previous joviality had drained away and been replaced by shame. It was smothered completely under a second hug as Twilight came around the table to join in. In time, the three broke apart and Celestia poured out the tea before picking up the tail once more. In the end, I had little choice but to crush those who worshipped the nightmare. A few who had fallen too far were placed into Tartarus, but most thankfully went back to quieter lives once I had disbanded their organisations and handed out more lenient punishments. She paused to sip her tea. 
The experience soured me on being worshipped as a whole. I'm still a pony, and what happened with Luna reminded me of how fallible I am. It took several generations, but I broke apart those who followed me as well. So, you both had cults that worshipped you, but you broke them up because you didn't like having an ego? Twilight cocked her head to the side, trying to make sure that she was taking the proper moral from this. And that such things will go bad, Celestia noted. Can go bad, was Celestia's correction. Will, came the quick counter, and Celestia cited, As you can see, Twilight, we've had a long-standing disagreement about this since Luna's return. She feels that there is no harm in such worship, that it is merely a way for ponies to express themselves and their views. Luna picked up another scone and spread a bit of clotted cream on it. And she is of the mind that even the ones formed with the best intentions are corruptible and in time inevitably slide towards darkness. She popped a chunk of baked goods into her mouth and continued to spite the heinous etiquette violation. Thus, tis better to break them early before that path can be trod. Twilight looked back and forth between the two former princesses, a frown etched deep on her face. She had been hoping for advice, but this wasn't helping. What about Cadence? She's an alicorn too. When did she have to deal with this? Your sister-in-law found a third path, which I fear would not work for you. Celestia shook her head gently. She chose to steer the cult she found by portraying herself as an avatar of the Crystal Heart. She became merely the stand-in for it, and her warship strengthens the heart and thus her empire. That did seem like a very cadence way to handle things, but Celestia was right. That didn't help Twilight very much. She didn't have a massively powerful artifact that fed off love to aim the cult at. Unless she did. Well, they like books. So what if I... Celestia cut in before that thought could be completed. Twilight, I want you to think back to your singular overdue book and the adventure you had returning it. Now imagine how that would have gone if the library were staffed by religious fanatics who consider each book a sacred object. Barely able to suppress her snickers, Luna added, Imagine the late fees! Twilight's face fell. My advice, Celestia offered, is to squash this one immediately. If you decide to take a different approach later, I assure you from experience that another will appear in due time. But you are unprepared to deal with this now, my former student, and I know you're never happy to make a large choice that you rush into without proper... She smirked with amusement. Research. Luna waved half a scone at Twilight. And my advice is to leave them be. You are the princess of friendship. To go in and punish ponies for having an enthusiastic hobby of their own free will is anathema to who you are. You will grow used to the adoration in time, Twilight. There is no avoiding it in the role you have chosen. Accept it with grace and use your position to steer them true. Letting out a deep sigh, Twilight nodded. Thank you, both of you. You've given me a lot to think about. I'm sorry that I disturbed your retirement for something like... Twilight, if you think you're about to leave and brood about this, you are sorely mistaken. Celestia poked her purple friend with her teacup. You've dealt with business, and now I fully expect you to stay for lunch and tell Luda and I all about how things have been for you lately. Slinging a companionable wing across Twilight, Luna beamed. Indeed! You have been most lax with your letters, and we demand a full accounting of how all of our friends in Candela and Podyville have been doing. And just like that, the threatening malaise lifted from Twilight's brightening face. I suppose it would be rude if I didn't. Rarity practically demanded I pass along her well wishes next time I saw you. Do so, and tell us well of the Apple Newlyweds, Luna winked playfully. I am most curious how they have settled in. And so, the next few hours passed as Twilight liked them, with friends. Chapter 3 Test In 
the dark of the night, plenies gathered around the bonfire. Deep purple robes shrouded them all, concealing identity even from each other. The opening of their gathering had already passed, and they were once more breaking up into their individual groups. The positions were taken with care, and each made sure they had a partner. As he walked around the perimeter, their leader looked over his gathering. Every pony is with someone. Good. None should study alone because... As one, their voices rose. Friend! And they were interrupted. Friendship is magic! Nearly three dozen sets of eyes turned, and nearly three dozen jaws dropped. Twilight Sparkle, THE Princess Twilight Sparkle, stood at the edge of the clearing. If any of them said a word, it was drowned out by the crackle of the bonfire and the rapid beating of their hearts. Hesitantly, Twilight took another step closer. Hello, my friends! That snapped them out of it. The word was magic, dispelling the silence. Mumbled voices conferred, each confirming that THE Princess Twilight Sparkle had just addressed them as FRIEND. At first one bowed to her, and then the others quickly after. No, 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 no! Twilight trotted forward and lifted the nearest pony to his hooves. Friends, don't bow to friends! And yet the rest of them still bowed to her. Even the one she lifted went down again as soon as she let go. Frustration was already starting to rise within the princess, but she reminded herself she had to address this. If not for this group, for the future ones, Celestia and Luna had been clear on that much. She'd have to deal with this again, and wasting this first opportunity for direct study would be shameful. So Twilight took a deep breath. As your goddess, she started, I hereby order you to stop worshipping me. The congregation froze, looking at one another in confusion. But if we stop worshipping her, she's not our goddess anymore. Yeah, then she doesn't have the authority to order us to do things. So then we could start worshipping her again. Paradox! It's a logical paradox! Calm down, you fools! Can't you see she's testing us? Yes, a test! A test of faith! Quick, who has a copy of Zeno's we can reference? I can't believe she has come to test our faith directly! Praise be! Twilight Phase 2 Oh no, they were the worst kind of cultists. Moving on to Plan C, Twilight wrapped the leader in her magic and pulled him over. You're in charge here? Get them up. I'm here to talk and we can't have a conversation when you're all, um... She looked out at the cult around her. Worship, E. The leader once more bowed, making Twilight roll her eyes before she turned to the rest. She has commanded us, so let us listen to her words. Come, friends, there's no harm here. If she will speak, we should listen. The crowd rumbled uneasily, but slowly obeyed. They came closer, sitting in a loose horseshoe around Twilight. She breathed a little easier. Now came the hard part. If only she had brought Spike. A scroll of paper and quill appeared out of the air beside her. Question one. Why worship? Why religion instead of other methods? Several of the cultists blinked owishly. One raised a hoop. Is this a quiz? I'm bad at quizzes. Twilight smiled as best as she could under the weight of this ludicrous situation. It is, but there is no right or wrong answer. We're friends, right? And friends try to learn more about each other. And use field observation to create a hypothesis for later testing. But they didn't need to know that part. Getting the first one to speak was difficult as they hesitated. Well, I do it because I used to worship Celestia, but you took over for her, so it makes sense to change. The dam broke and the other answers unleashed rapid fire. You defeated all those bad guys, so you're a hero. I joined thinking this was your fan club and it just got intense from there. Lemon Wedge over there's my friend and makes a really good fruit salad she brings every week. We were going to summon the demon Biblios. I don't have anything else to do on Thursday nights and my neighbours said it would be fun. 
you're really hot and I thought being part of your cult would give me a shot at asking you out. So, um, want to go out? Twilight waited patiently for the cacophony to die down and the last of them to get their justifications out. Each one was written down, recorded for later reference. All right, thank you. Let's start from the top. She adjusted the scroll, looking doubted. Whoever said something about summoning a demon, first of all, Biblios isn't real. Second, go over there and sit quietly. You're under arrest. Summoning creatures from beyond is bad. Don't do that. Oh, man. Off to the side, she scolded. If this wasn't in the middle of the woods, I'd have you stand in a corner and think about what you tried to do. As it is, wait quietly and we'll have a conversation with the royal guards later. Twilight waited as the shame-faced cultist obeyed. A hoof raised from the crowd and Twilight nodded to it. I thought you said there were no right or wrong answers to this. Twilight closed her eyes and took a deep breath before answering. There are no right or wrong questions for this quiz, but there are wrong answers for life. Summoning creatures from beyond the veil is one of them. She looked around those gathered as they nodded and agreed that was reasonable. Okay, second, thank you for saying that I'm attractive, but I'm afraid I don't have time for a relationship right now. I'm running a country and I'm in charge of multiple stellar bodies, so dating is going to have to wait. The stallion who had mentioned that motivation perked up. So you're saying there's a chance later? When Tartarus freezes over, Twilight clarified. Sorry, but you're not my type. A mare, several cultists down, hopped up and let out a joyous whoop. Ha! In your face! I told you she didn't swing that way! Once more, Twilight Phase 2. That's not... It's because you joined a dark shadow cult instead of speaking to me. That's not a good basis for a relationship. Her wings fluffed out with frustration and a brief bit of appreciation for what Cadence probably had to deal with on a regular basis. Next, the fan club. Her eyes focused dead on one specific cultist. Star Tracker, I know that's you. I recognize your voice. She recognized my voice. Star Tracker. Twilight could already feel her patience wearing away under the table. You know better than this. And we already had a friendship lesson about idolizing other ponies and that sort of thing. Also, I know you're fully aware of my actual fan club. This is silly. Go home. She watched him turn and head out with his head hung low. Now, the princess glanced at her list. A bunch of you are just here because of friends or because you don't have anything better to do or because of... She squinted at her own horn writing. Fruit salad. You can also go. I appreciate wanting to do things with your friends and to have a hobby but I'm going to politely ask that you take up bowling or knitting instead of revering me as a goddess. Also, it's honestly a little insulting to be the sort of thing that you do when you don't have anything else to do. I'll do you when... Twilight struck the stallion who continued to insist on hitting on her with a stun blast. Lewd innuendo in public is also not a good way to try and secure a relationship with Subhody. The stunned stallion was quickly carried off by several friends, leaving a crowd much smaller than before. Twilight looked them over with a critical eye, trying to appraise just what she was dealing with. Those of you who remain, you're true believers, right? The ones who are part of this because you believe? Looks were shared between the seven that remained before they nodded as one. Good. Question two was going to be why me, but I guess that's been sort of covered. Plus, you know, the whole sun and moon thing. So, um, question three. If I leave you alone after this, what are you going to do with this, um, organization after I go? Once more, the cult's leader stepped forward. We shall take the word of your great name and spread it across a quick twilight, cut him off. Okay, yeah, no, we're not doing that. No proselytizing, no conversions, definitely no crusades. In fact, here. She floated a second scroll and her quill over to one of the remaining cultists. We better set some ground rules. She shall pronounce her commandments unto us. Praise be! 
This was already going wrong again. Just, just write it down. Twilight almost felt like she was begging. Rule one, no black magic. Don't be that guy over there. She pointed her hoof at the demon-loving cultist who was still sitting and waiting for the guard pickup. Rule two, no forcing any pony to believe what you do if they don't want to. Rule three, no sacrificing anything or any pony to me. Twilight halted, then corrected herself. Any creature to me, just in case. Rule four, um... She bubbled, having already ran out of steam. Anyway, you get the idea. Those that remained all bowed once more. Yes, we hear and understand. We shall obey your commandments and serve you well. Good. Be well, my friends. Twilight stepped back and took to the sky. After flying out of sight, she teleported back to the camouflage duck blind that had been set up beside the clearing. Agents! She nodded to the SMILE team that was in place. You understand your orders, I presume? The black-suited earth pony mare saluted. Yes, your highness. Watch them. Record our observations and give you monthly reports on activity. Interfere only on your direct orders so that we preserve the integrity of the experiment. Twilight nodded with a grin. Wonderful. If everything goes well, we might even be able to get a paper in one of the big name journals about this. Decree by Zontan Sign there. Twilight looked down at the holographic paper in front of her, reading the words but barely processing them. We, the ponies of New Cantalot, representing the sovereign nation of Equestria, in accordance with the laws and regulations, the words blurred together as the legal language went on and on. Twilight had tried to keep up with it, but the law changed so often these days that she could never remember what was new and what was old. The last time she had tried to cite the law to prove a point, she had been informed that the law she was referring to hadn't been in effect for 300 years. Besides, it didn't matter. Her advisers had informed her that the document was very legal and had gone through all the proper channels, and really, all that mattered was the line at the bottom. Do hereby dissolve the position of monarch of Equestria, stripping it of all rights and privileges, effective immediately. Twilight touched her hoof to the blinking indicator. There was a hum and a green ring flashed around her hoof, followed by words flowing onto the page. Signed, Princess Twilight Sparkle, monarch of Equestria. Then, even as she watched, there was a chime, and her signature changed, her title disappearing before her eyes. She didn't doubt that the system had already updated her signature on every document she'd ever put it onto in the last hundred years. It was, after all, very efficient, and had been designed by ponies much smarter than her. Thank you, Miss Sparkle, the bureaucrat in front of her said primly, taking the digital document and dismissing it. Twilight opened her mouth to correct him, but then stopped, thought about it, and slowly began to laugh. It was strained, desperate, almost crazed. The title she'd held for thousands of years wasn't hers anymore. 
It didn't even exist. Her ponies had decided they didn't need it. How could she do anything but laugh? By the time she had recovered, wiping tears from her eyes, she was alone once more. Twilight stepped out onto the roof of the palace, looking out over the city. She couldn't see the edge of it anymore, and hadn't been able to for centuries. New cantalot stretched all the way around the entire mountain now, metal and chrome as far as the eye could see. Even the mountain was mostly machinery these days. After it and the original cantalot had been largely demolished almost 2,000 years ago, Twilight remembered the monster that had done it, a massive elemental spirit, but she couldn't remember which element bearers had helped her defeat it. Sometimes she wondered what that said about her. She touched the device she wore on one wrist, and after a moment of scrolling, selected a name from the list it displayed. A low hum of Magitech greeted her, and a teleportation circle materialised around her. She shivered as the foreign magic latched onto her, encompassing her in a teleportation matrix so complex it was unrecognisable to her. And then in a flash she was gone. She appeared hundreds of miles away, in front of a three-storey mansion that was downright rustic by the standard of today's ponies. She didn't need to knock, the door scanned her before she even came near, letting the occupant know she was there. By the time she reached the door, it was already sliding open. My dear Twilight, Celestia exclaimed, spreading her hooves and pulling Twilight into a hug. To what do we owe the pleasure? Twilight leaned into the hug and her chest suddenly felt tight. Before she knew it, she was sobbing into Celestia's shoulder, gesturing vaguely with one hoof and failing to form any words at all. Oh dear, Celestia said. She turned her head and murmured, Go wake up Luna, we may need her. Slowly, carefully, she led Twilight to a couch. Once she had applied the correct amount of blankets, all of them, she touched a hoof to the coffee table and with a press of a button conjured a steaming cup of tea. There you are, she murmured soothingly passing it to Twilight. Tell me what's wrong. Twilight took the tea, but didn't drink it, instead just staring at it like she'd never seen a teacup before. Finally, she let out a soft laugh. They fired me, she whispered. Celestia blinked. I'm sorry? Twilight laughed again, but there was no humour in it. They fired me. They wrote up a law, and they put it through the proper channels, things I helped set up to make sure I could know what my ponies wanted and what they wanted wasn't me. She took a slow sip of tea. It burned her mouth, but she didn't care. It was all very official. I'm not a princess anymore. They decided they didn't need me. Oh, Twilight, Celestia murmured. I'm so sorry. She touched one hoof to Twilight's shoulder. I'm sure that must have been very hard. The sound of hoof steps announced another arrival and Luna stepped into the room. She took one look at Twilight and a frown crossed her face. What has happened this time? She asked. Celestia turned. The bureaucrats seem to have taken the final step in making Alicorns obsolete, she said quietly. They removed Twilight from power. Luna blinked then snorted. About time. Luna! Celestia hissed. Twilight is very upset. Luna rolled her eyes, stepping forward and leaning on the back of the couch. Tell me, Twilight, were you happy doing what they were doing? Were you making difficult decisions, weighing the lives of your ponies and every creature else? Were you using your fantastic abilities to save the realm from your foes? Twilight looked up, her eyes red. Slowly, she shook her head. As I thought, the world has moved past us. Do not be sad because it has only now decided to tell you this. Twilight nodded mutely, taking another sip of her tea. 
It tasted of salt. Celestia sighed. Luna, while you may be right, now isn't the time. Come, Twilight, say something. We are both here for you. Twilight put down the tea. You're probably right, she said dully. I should have seen this coming. I mean, I did see this coming. It's not like I didn't know about it. But I thought, I thought it was just a few ponies. Ponies who were discontent or who didn't want to follow my rules. I thought if I just let them be, they would see that life was fine without my intervention, just like they wanted, and everything would be fine. She shook her head. I never, I never expected it to pass. Celestia sighed. It is a hard thing to see your people outgrow you, she said softly, but it is a natural part of life. Mothers watch their children grow up. Teachers have to let their students graduate. Luna stepped in. And rulers must let their people decide how they wish to be ruled. You're lucky that they informed you with rules and law, rather than violent rebellion. Hey, Twilight protested. There hasn't been a violent rebellion in Equestria in my entire reign. My ponies were happy. I helped them be happy. And this is the thanks I get. Your thanks is that they no longer need you, Luna said. That is a noble end for any leader to look forward to. It doesn't feel noble. Luna smiled softly. Perhaps not, but it is nonetheless. Celestia stepped in. Twilight, you were a good leader. You're wise and kind and honest and loyal and generous. You've done so much for Equestria. Your legacy will live on forever just as ours did. Surely you have never thought less of us for stepping down when Equestria no longer needed us. Twilight shook her head. Then do not think less of yourself. You did all that you could. She paused, then smiled slyly. Besides, there's plenty of perks to retirement. You'll have time to travel the world? Luna rolled her eyes. Oh, not this again. You haven't even heard. I do not need to. Luna turned away. I am going back to bed. Twilight, if you want my advice, run while you still can. Otherwise, the guest room is yours. Hey, we are going to get you to come back here. Twilight watched the two of them run off. Finally, she giggled. A real, genuine laugh for the first time today. Maybe she could live with this after all. The First Edict by The Red Parade Sign there, please. Twilight looked down at the tablet, then looked up at the mare in front of her. The mare was dressed in the typical forest green uniform of the International Office of Requisitions. Her pale blonde mane fell over her viewing glasses, endless lists of data scrolling away in front of her eyes. Twilight missed the brown uniform of the Equestrian Postal Service, but that uniform, like the Equestrian Postal Service itself, had long since faded away with the development of local teleportation technologies. There was no need for mail ponies anymore. The mail service had become so obsolete, in fact, that all the world's postal services were folded into one entity, which only served to administrate the automated services, and occasionally carry out menial verification tasks. But as Twilight looked at the Pegasus in front of her, something felt vaguely familiar. She just couldn't place it. Ma'am? Twilight blinked as the mayor prompted her again. Oh, I'm sorry. I've a bit on my mind today. That's quite all right, ma'am, but I need your signature. She gestured to the tablet again with a taut smile her mind already going back to the list of tasks she had left to do today. Twilight took the offered stylus in her magic and began to etch her name. For a second she considered adding her now defunct title for fun, but decided against it. 
This mare probably had enough things to worry about than some scorned, spiteful pony. Thank you, ma'am, the mare said, pulling the tablet away. Two automatic carts of books drifted towards her, strapped in and secured with all the protections the world could offer. The mare turned to leave, but paused when Twilight called out to her. Wait, Twilight gave a strained smile as the mare turned around again. I'm so sorry for asking, but are you from Ponyville by chance? The mare blinked, then laughed. Ponyville? No, ma'am, I'm from Manhattan. Is your family? asked Twilight. No, not that I know of, answered the mare. Anything else I can do for you? Twilight faltered with a sigh. No, that's fine, thank you. The mare tipped her cap and trotted back towards her messenger bike. The bike's engines roared and the craft lifted up into the air, disappearing for the main city in the blink of an eye. Twilight watched as it became a pinprick over the horizon, something turning in her heart, something she couldn't place. Why had she asked her that? Why had she seemed familiar? Twilight didn't know, but she had met hundreds of thousands of ponies during her reign. Perhaps they had crossed paths at one point. She sighed and turned to re-enter her home. As she stepped forwards, the mechanical carts followed her into the home. Hello, Hello Twilight. Twilight! A mechanical voice beeped as a coloured sphere floated out from a pod in the wall. Would, Would you, you like me to sort your delivery? delivery? No thanks, Tiberius. I'll take care of it myself. Twilight answered, rubbing the base of her horn. Of course, is there anything else I can do for you? Twilight paused to consider this. Actually, I'm kind of craving muffins right now. The robot let out a beep that almost sounded sympathetic. Shall I place an order with the old bakery? That would be excellent. Thank you, Tiberius. Twilight replied with a small smile. As the robot puttered off, Twilight continued her trek to her room. She guided the carts to the corner and removed their protective coverings. Twilight picked one book off the stack, flipping through the pages and enjoying their signature smell. It had been a long time since she had put a physical book in her hooves, but it was as good a place as any. Once she was caught up on the older books, she could move on to the online database. But as Twilight flicked through the book flippantly, her hopeful mood was suddenly dampened. She didn't want to read right now. With a sigh, she returned the book and went over to her desk. One hobby she had been attempting to get into recently was sketching. Twilight seized a stylus and summoned a piece of hollow paper. She let out a hum, trying to think of a subject to draw. Twilight glanced at her smart tablet, skimming some of the headlines. One headline caught her eye. Heritage Committee to Honour Element Bearers in Ceremony. The Element Bearers? Twilight wasn't even sure who the current ones were. It had truly been a long time since she had known any of them intimately, and there had been several times when she had mixed up their names. That gave her a small smile, though it returned that strange feeling in her heart. She decided that she'd draw her friends. With a plan in mind, Twilight went to work. In a couple of minutes, she had produced the form of an alicorn and began to make it rarity. But a thought occurred to her that froze her pen. How many diamonds were on rarity's cutie mark? Twilight went to activate her tablet, but scowled. You shouldn't need that, Twilight. You knew rarity for years. She had four? Twilight went to sketch the diamonds in, but paused again. Were they square diamonds? No, they were triangles, right? She sketched some shapes, but immediately released them with a frown. No, no, I'm confusing her with Brilliant Gem, who had four diamonds as a cutie mark. Rarity had three, right? Twilight closed her eyes and tried to picture her friend. The features came easily at first. A rich coat with a coiled perfect mane a confident smile with warm, welcoming eyes. But as she tried to coax out the details, the picture in her mind became muddled. She squeezed her eyes shut harder, trying to conjure up images of her other friends. But just like with Rarity, 
The details blurred. She knew Applejack's warm smile, Fluttershy's kind eyes, Pinky's mane, and Rainbow's grin. But their coat colours were murky. Twilight couldn't recall their eye colours, or even their main styles. With a frustrated yell, she threw the hollow paper across the room as the truth finally settled in. I don't remember, Twilight whispered. I... I don't remember. Twilight? came Celestia's voice from the doorway. Your muffins are here. Is everything okay? Twilight turned to look at her former mentor, tears welling in her eyes. I... I don't remember my friends. Twilight slumped over at the table, poking at her untouched muffins. They were my best friends. They changed my life, and now I can barely remember them. Well, I remember their names, but I don't remember the details, Twilight said. They were my best friends. They changed my life, and now I can barely remember them. Celestia was quiet. Twilight sighed, leaning back in her chair. I'm sorry, it's just, I realised how out of touch I am now. Everything's changed now, I barely remember them, I barely remember Ponyville. She glanced out the dining room window, making out the towering skyscrapers of the city in the distance. When I was so busy with ruling, I hadn't noticed how much time I had missed. But now that's gone. She slumped over again and Celestia came around to put a hoof on her back. I may have an idea, she suggested. Twilight lifted her head, intrigued. Twilight, do you remember your very first edict after becoming ruler? I, Twilight pursed her lips in thought. I don't, she finally admitted. Celestia smiled. Then perhaps it's best if I reminded you. When Celestia had mentioned Old Town Ponyville, Twilight had wondered what parts of the town it included. She hadn't anticipated the district being the entire original city. The outskirts of Ponyville were foreign to Twilight. The buildings erected hundreds of thousands of years after she had left for Canterlot. But as they approached the heart of the original town, she began to notice subtle changes. A majority of the buildings had been reconstructed as time and nature had proved too much for even the best preservation efforts. But even if they were the same, Twilight wasn't sure if she would have remembered them. Twilight looked up and down the sleek metal streets. The layout looked mostly the same, but it was still jarring to look at. Though the buildings here weren't nearly as tall as the ones in New Canterlot, they still reached higher than the pastel thatched houses she was used to. Their designs felt like a meagre and lazy reproduction, flawed, incorrect and wrong. In fact, most of everything felt wrong, despite the hints of familiarity nestled within. There were cars and messenger bikes in the road instead of wooden carriages, computer and technology stores where the flower shops once were, and instead of familiar, friendly faces, Twilight was surrounded by a crowd of strangers. It was like she was coming to Ponyville for the first time all over again. Twilight had been to Ponyville in the past centuries. She was often invited to the Friendship School for commencement speeches and yearly ceremonies. But the last time she had been to Old Ponyville proper was when Rarity's boutique burned down in the fire. She shuddered, another strange feeling washing over her and numbing her appendages. The smartwatch on her foreleg beeped, and Twilight looked up to find her GPS had led her to a massive painted structure. Unlike the shapeless buildings around it, the architecture of this place was dated, with brightly painted walls and window frames. Just below the roof, in massive gold lettering, was etched its name, 
the Cherilee Museum of Equestrian History. And Twilight remembered her first edict. It diverted a set number of funds in the name of museums and heritage sites to honour and reflect on equestrian history, to honour those who had passed and the work they had done. But Twilight had never really seen the fruits of her labours until now. As she climbed up the steps, the automatic door slid open and Twilight was greeted with a rush of cold air. Her eyes widened as she took in the scene in front of her. The middle of the room held a circular self-service reception desk, with screens and monitors depicting a detailed layout of the museum. Behind that, nestled in between two grand staircases, was a gargantuan pink steam engine, its front windows carved in the shape of a heart. Dangling from the ceiling were two hot air balloons, billowing gently in the flow of the air conditioning. Behind the train, was a perfectly preserved mural that showed a crowd of ponies. In the middle was herself, staring up at the sky with wings spread. A brown and gold book was levitating above her head. Around her were a sea of familiar faces, their smiles frozen in time forever. Whoa! Twilight moved over to some of the display cases, peeking inside. The case lit up as she approached, illuminating the piece of parchment inside. Letter writing was an incredibly important aspect to everyday life, the automated narration stated. Back before instant communication was established, love letters such as this one were typically used to stay in touch during periods of extended leave. This letter is to a confectionery Bonnie from her lover Lyra. Twilight gently put a hoof on the glass, reading the contents of the letter to herself with amusement. Hello! She turned to see a small pink sphere floating towards her. I'm Starlight Glimmer. Sure you are, Twilight muttered. Welcome to the Cheerilee Museum of Equestrian History. I can serve as your personal tour guide for today's visit. Please don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions on any displays, artifacts or exhibitions. Would you like to hear about what special exhibitions we are currently hosting? Yes, please, Twilight answered. Great! The Cherilee Museum hosts several permanent exhibits, most notably our exhibition of the Age of Friendship. In addition, we also host the founding of Ponyville, history of communication and transportation, and development of Cloudsdale exhibits as well. Twilight blinked. The Age of Friendship? The Age of Friendship exhibit is dedicated to the first generation of element bearers Applejack, Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Rarity and Twilight Sparkle, Starlight explained. I'd like to start there. Starlight let out a series of happy bleeps. Great! Follow me! The bot flew off at a slow pace and Twilight followed it up the metallic staircase and deeper into the museum past artifacts that felt more familiar than anything else in the world. The Cheerilee Museum of Equestrian History is built over the location of the Ponyville Schoolhouse, which was first dated a historic site before it was destroyed by the consuming darkness about 2,000 years ago. Starlight explained, the museum was constructed adjacent of the defunct schoolhouse, but after its destruction, the government allowed the museum to be expanded over the former grounds. Twilight took in the information, eyes scanning the paintings and pictures hanging from the walls as they passed. Since its founding, the museum has played host to several noticeable exhibits over the course of its existence. For example, Luna collaborated to create an interactive experience on the dream realm following its collapse during the reign of silent wind. Starlight continued, they came to a stop outside of a lavishly decorated hallway portal. Six large banners hung to the sides of the entrance, each one depicting a cutie mark of one of her friends. The phrase, the age of friendship, Equestria's golden age, was etched in bold lettering in between. Twilight stood in awe of the entrance staring up at the words, 
Memories began to swirl in her mind as if blown by the wind. Echoes of voices in the chambers of her mind. Starlight waited patiently until Twilight summoned the courage to move again. The tiny robot guided her through the entry where she found herself in a pitch black hole. Honesty! A disembodied voice spoke the word and on Twilight's left a hologram projected an image of a crystallized apple onto the wall. Loyalty! Another symbol appeared, this of a lightning bolt joining the apple on the left wall. Generosity! Kindness! Laughter! A diamond, butterfly and balloon appeared on the walls with the diamond on the left and the others on the right. And finally, magic. The final symbol appeared on the right wall, one of a six-pointed star. These are the elements of harmony. Over the years, they have had many bearers, but this was not always the case. The symbols faded away, leaving twilight in the darkness as the narration continued. Thousands and thousands of years ago, Equestria entered the Age of Friendship, a movement which produced some of the greatest heroes our world has ever seen. The hallway was then flooded with bright light as a chorus of voices began playing over the speakers. Yet the exposure wasn't harsh. Instead, it was soft, comforting in a strange sort of way. The walls began changing from solid colour into black and white images and Twilight began hearing words and lines from the voices. Ain't no work like hard work, Sugar Cube, but it'll be all worth it in the end. Try to keep up with me, then we'll talk. Darling, you should never measure yourself by someone else's standards. Oh, if you ever need help, my cottage is always open. Let's celebrate, and after that we'll celebrate again, because you're that special. Never underestimate the power of friendship. If you ever need a friend, I'll always be with you. Twilight didn't remember saying that, but it was undeniably her voice. But more importantly, it was the voice of her friends. She watched as the images came to life, gradually gaining colour and depth. She watched as Applejack bucked a tree and Fluttershy knelt by a river, and as Rainbow led a flight formation through the air and Rarity presented her latest design, Pinkie Pie seized a turntable silently commandeering some unseen party. Finally, she saw herself talking with a tiny dragon who scribbled a note on her back. My, my friends, she whispered. She reached a wall out to touch them, but her hoof passed through the hologram. All too soon, the symphony of voices faded away and the characters projected assembled. Twilight watched as they engaged in a group hug and froze as the lights began to turn back on and the narration resumed. Join us and discover the story of the six ponies who set the course for equestrian history and begun what some argue was a golden era. Welcome to the Age of Friendship. Soon, Twilight was standing alone in an empty hallway again, but the feeling instilled from the short cinematic had not gone away. She felt something churning in her gut, like a bomb ready to explode, and it pushed hard against her chest and heart. Right this way, Starlight gently suggested. Yes, of course, Twilight replied, speaking through the lump in her throat. Lead the way. The tiny robot flew down the hall, keeping its pace with Twilight's movement. They passed through the second set of doors and emerged in a large circular room with the words, the element of honesty projected onto the ceiling above. Immediately, Twilight's eyes were drawn to a display case in the centre of the room, illuminated from below by a spotlight. Applejack, the first element of honesty, was a member of the famous Apple family. Starlight said, even today, descendants of the family still occupy various positions in Equestria. One might even be your neighbour, Twilight didn't pay attention to any of this. She stopped in front of the case, which held a single object, a tattered and patched brown Stetson hat. It floated serenely in the case, suspended in thin air as if it were floating in water. The lump in Twilight's throat grew larger as she tried to speak. Is this, was this one of hers? This hat was donated to the museum by descendants of the Apple family. 
Starlight replied. The family verifies that it was indeed one of hers. Twilight pressed her hoof against the glass, staring at the hat, her imagination filled in the rest, adding the tears and face and neck of her old friend. Slowly she turned to view the rest of the room. Plaques and display cases had been carefully spaced out and another holographic projector offered a life-size replica of Applejack in mid-buck. Slideshows of coloured photographs also played along the far walls, each one lingering before it transformed into another. As she began to walk, memories of conversations and interactions from thousands of years ago began to return. She recalled visiting Applejack on the farm and the two holding a conversation while she worked, bucking each and every tree with confidence and precision. A loyal and dependable friend to all, it is said that Applejack never told a lie, Starlight said, yet her dedication and resilience never seemed to waver as she continued to provide for her family, her farm and her friends. Twilight paused in front of a display case, one that held a lasso and a series of rusted tools. She really was a dependable friend, Twilight answered. She found herself missing the natural, imperfect apples that Applejack would always offer, especially when every apple now was doused in chemicals and magic spells and looked so perfect it was unnatural. She sighed as she finished her rounds of the room, finding none of the artifacts familiar or enticing to her. Starlight, I think I'm ready to move on. Of course. Starlight led the way down the hall into the next room. Twilight paused before leaving, turning to examine the room one more time. The animated recording of Applejack winked at the camera. Twilight smiled and left the room. The next room was the colour of the sky, which made perfect sense. Always a restless soul, but nonetheless loyal to her friends, Rainbow Dash was the perfect embodiment of the element of loyalty, Starlight said as they entered the room. Rainbow's room featured her cutie mark painted on a massive scale on the floor. The ceiling above was clouded with simulated clouds, reminding Twilight of the original Cloudsdale before its anchoring. The holographs sat in the middle of the room, depicting an animated rainbow in flight. She'd occasionally look to her right and put on another burst of speed in a desperate race against an unseen opponent. Rainbow's display cases were filled with medals and trophies, along with certificates and documents and autographed photos of the speedster. It would have been enough to fuel her ego for millions of years. Rainbow Dash not only made history as an element of harmony, but she became a legend amongst competitive flyers as well. Rainbow was named the youngest captain of the Wonderbolts, surpassing her mentor, Spitfire Maverick, and holding the record until 2,000 years ago with the promotion of Cerulean Ascension. Twilight took all this information in with a wistful sigh, scanning the endless shelves of memorabilia. I remember I wonder what Rainbow would think of the Wonderbolts today. An excellent question, as in Rainbow Dash's time, the Wonderbolts were composed solely of natural born, unassisted flyers. Today, the Wonderbolts are divided into several categories, including unassisted Pegasi, machine assisted Pegasi, and mechanical flight teams. An interesting note is that the signature Sonic Rainboom created by Rainbow is now a staple of Wonderbolt shows typically performed by aircraft or a machine-assisted Pegasus. That stirred something in Twilight. It made her angry that something so unique and special to Rainbow could now be done by any pony with the help of a machine, just like how Applejack's homegrown apples had become faceless and mass-produced. Were they getting phased out, like how Twilight was? Were they all nothing more than toys to be discarded after the world got tired of them? Twilight shook off the thought with a shudder, finding some solace in Rainbow's hologram. 
She thought back to the late night conversation she had with Rainbow when she was seeking advice on a political matter. Rainbow, in a typical headstrong manner, had advised her to take a stand and double down, to never yield on something she believed in. If you're ready, we can move to the next room, Starlight suggested. Twilight nodded, and the two followed the carpeted path into the next encounter. The hologram's eyes almost seemed to follow them out of the room. The third room was lavish, but fittingly so. Never one to stay hidden in the background, Rarity was certain to make a splash in every room she entered, but beyond that, she was always able to lend a hoof to whoever would need it, a trait that made her perfect for the element of generosity, Starlight reported. Rarity's room was designed like a runway. Several replica dresses were positioned on ponychrons, Protected by a thin magical barrier, blueprints and notes from Rarity herself were laminated and locked in display cases along with strips of fabric and stray pieces of accessories. Next to the hologram, floating in another secure container, was a dress that looked incredibly familiar to Twilight. Is that an original? The dress is indeed crafted from Rarity herself and is one of the museum's most prized pieces, confirmed Starlight. It was donated to the Cantalot Archive who transferred it to us, and originally included a tiara as well. However, that is kept in our vault for safekeeping. This dress was actually worn by Rarity during the Grand Galloping Gala, Twilight finished, glancing up at the intricate fabric. I remember she spent hours just cleaning it after that disaster of a night, and as she remembered that one night, she began to remember others as well. All those nights spent drinking tea and conversing with her friend had kept her sane over the years, and she would always look forward to her visits to Canterlot. Twilight turned away from the original to look at the replicas. They were certainly Rarity's designs, but they were miles different from anything Rarity had made herself. The plaque mounted next to them stated that each replica dress was created from designs and sketches Rarity herself left behind, crafted with synthetic materials to resemble what would have been available at the time in articulate and precise machines. They were copies, Twilight decided, copies of something long gone. She turned to gaze at the holographic Rarity with a pair of red reading glasses perched on her muzzle, expression deep in thought. I think I'm ready, she said. Starlight clicked and word in response, and the two left the holographic rarity to her work. Although soft-spoken, Fluttershy actually holds an incredibly extensive repertoire. Not only was she the element of kindness, but her accolades also include being the first warden of the Everfree Forest, animal rescue specialist, and senior environmental advisor for Twilight Sparkle's administration. Fluttershy's room was quiet, decorated with a mix of fake trees and live plants. Hidden speakers played animal sounds to further immerse Twilight in the scene, and an indoor water field in the corner of the room completed the look. Her individual accomplishments should not be scoffed either. Her reformation of Discord, for example, is one of the most notable reformations in history, on par with the Changeling Reformation, the redemption of Lonesome Moon, and the return of the late Queen Chrysalis, Starlight reported. The hologram of Fluttershy didn't seem to notice their entrance. She sat by a makeshift river, surrounded by rabbits and raccoons, all vying for her attention. Unlike the other rooms, however, this one held considerably less display cases. You may notice this room is a bit barren in regards to artifacts, Starlight explained. That is because most of Fluttershy's legacy was tangible in other ways, 
Her work in animal care is further documented and explained in our sister museum, the Museum of Natural History, and in the Everfree National Parks Museum. Twilight nodded, leaning against the railing which separated her from the running water. Fluttershy giggled as a bird perched itself on her shoulder. Starlight, do you know what happened to Fluttershy's cottage? Starlight clicked and whirred, summoning the information from the database. Fluttershy's cottage was destroyed during the Everfree fires. A replica was built in its location and is used by the National Park Service as an animal care centre and field research site. Twilight sighed at that, eyes falling on a plaque mentioning Discord's reformation. She hadn't seen much of the Lord of Chaos recently, but he was most certainly still around to terrorise the current element bearers. From what she had heard though, he was noticeably colder to the element of kindness. She recalled a tea party with both Fluttershy and Discord present, and how she had enjoyed being able to relax and unplug from the hectic life of a politician. Fluttershy was always there to lend her ear and her heart even to the most undesirable of ponies. Twilight had made a constant effort to hold herself to the same level of patience and understanding Fluttershy did. But even after thousands of years, Fluttershy still outperformed her. Fluttershy giggled again, and Twilight pulled away. Her heart felt as if it were about to burst, but she swallowed hard and swore to persevere. Let's... let's go to the last room, please. Twilight complied, and they left the serene forest scene behind. This next room may be hard on the eyes. If you have an underlying medical condition, I would advise you to skip this room or apply your shielding devices should you have them available. Starlight warned before the next door opened. I'm fine, Twilight remarked, clearing her throat before speaking. Okay, then let's meet the element of laughter. The doors swung open and Twilight was met with a triumphant blast of confetti. Her eyes were simply assaulted by a very pink room complete with balloons and party decoration hanging from the ceiling. Energetic music pumped out of the speakers, giving the entire room a vibrant feel. It did nothing to help with the lead in Twilight's chest. In the middle of the room, rotating on a pedestal, was a sleek and recognisable bright blue party cannon. Twilight approached it, a painful nostalgia swirling in her head as she put her hoof on the barrel Twilight suddenly found herself face to face with a pair of eyes. Gah! Twilight recoiled, her horn sparking with energy, before the foam in the cannon poked its soft, poofy mane out of the barrel and waved at her. Pinkie Pie, the legendary party planner of Ponyville, was perhaps the best fit for the role of Element of Laughter, a mare also known for her longevity and spontaneous behaviour. Pinkie Pie made the world a better place just by being in it. The holographic Pinkie hopped out of the cannon and trotted around to the rear, fiddling with the fuse and adjusting its course. Twilight gasped for her, her heartbeat still racing. She scrambled to her hooves, suddenly feeling quite dizzy. As she leaned against the wall, Twilight looked up to see a large photograph of her friends and herself gathered around a large table with a birthday cake in the middle. She felt like throwing up. Are you alright? Starlight asked. Should I summon medical services? I'm fine, Twilight's voice sounded echoey, as if she were submerged in water. I just... I need a minute. Starlight floated by her side. Shall we continue to the next exhibit on Twilight Sparkle? That won't be necessary, Twilight said hurriedly. With that, she turned and stumbled out of the room. Her stomach churned as she retraced her steps. The holograms of her old friend staring as she passed. Twilight bit down hard on her lips, tears blurring her vision as she stumbled through the main hall, as unearthed memories racked through her mind. She remembered Spike's first birthday in Ponyville, and the Grand Galloping Galas, and Rarity visiting Manhattan, and Rainbow's acceptance into the Wonderbolts, and Pinky's visit to the Yaks, and Applejack overworking herself, and Fluttershy's short career as a model, 
she remembered Starlight and Trixie and Luster and Sunburst and Shining Armor and the Cakes and Zakora and her parents and... Twilight stumbled down the steps and from her mouth tumbled a forlorn and despairing scream. As she fell to the ground, the bomb inside of her went off and Twilight's heart exploded. She didn't know how long she lay on the grass before she snapped out of her haze. Twilight was laying in a grassy field just behind the museum, overlooking the starlight, glimmer, University of Friendship and Old Town Ponyville. The sun was just setting overhead, with the silhouettes of pegasi and vehicles dotting the air in the distance. Few clouds hung overhead, white and puffy and natural. They drifted by aimlessly, paying little attention to the alicorn far below them. Twilight was exhausted, her eyes were still red and her throat raw from crying. Apparently she had caused a disturbance with her breakdown, but everyone had left her alone now, alone with nothing but her thoughts and fractured memories to keep her company. She let out a sigh, but it held no mirth. Twilight looked up at the sky and had an idea. She barely had the strength to move her hooves, but a pale white sphere formed around her horn. It glided up into the air above her, and when it made contact with a cloud, it began to whirl faster and faster. Soon it had divided several chunks of clouds into segments and began shaping them. Twilight smiled a bit wider, guiding the ball with her last reserves of brain power. After a few minutes, the clouds became faces from the shapeless forms Twilight carved her friends. She made Applejack complete with her Stetson and Rainbow with a mischievous grin. Next to them she crafted Fluttershy hiding behind her mane, then Rarity with a needle in her magic, and Pinkie Pie mid-cheer. When they were done she seized more clouds and continued her work. Even as her eyes began to droop, she crafted Spike taking a note, then Starlight flying a kite and Trixie performing a spell. Each face brought a dozen more, and soon Twilight was creating dozens of faces from her past. Lyra, Minuet, Moondancer, Bon Bon, Apple Bloom, Sweetie Belle, Scootaloo, Cheerily, Star Swirl, and the Pillars, her parents and her brother. The list went on and on, until Twilight's chin fell, and the ball of magic dissipated without any further instruction. And that was how Celestia found her, leaning against a tree and fast asleep, with faces of her friends keeping vigil above her, surrounded by the memories of their names, nostalgic but not broken, tired but not alone, and above her the skies carried on forever. Twilight Sparkle Falls in Love with Sand by Greenback Before she had become the ruler of Equestria, Twilight had enjoyed having at least one day off a week between her studies and all the various troubles that life threw her way. But now that she had ascended to the throne, her days off were few and far between, with an endless stream of disputes to settle, treaties to negotiate, and matters of state to attend to. Twilight could go months without having a day to herself. It wasn't until Spike presented a carefully researched presentation on how overwork negatively impacted the health, well-being, and lifespan of workaholics that she finally agreed to a new schedule of having one day off a week. And to commemorate this new change, she and her number one assistant would enjoy a day at the beach. Now, standing before the sand, Twilight and Spike surveyed their playground. The sky was the cleanest, most vibrant blue imaginable. The sun was pleasantly warm, and the sea calmly came in and out upon the sand. Well, here we are, 
Spike said, the perfect place to kick back and relax. Yes, Twilight said with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm. Twilight, I know you want to work, but you promised that you... It's not work, Spike, Twilight said. It's... What? What is it? Twilight sighed. There was no way to confess her secret without sounding like a moron. It's the... Sand. Sand? Yes, sand. To tell the truth, I've never liked it. Really? Is it because it's coarse, rough, irritating, and gets everywhere? Pretty much. Well, you can always teleport yourself to the water, Spike suggested. Or I can put a towel on the sand, and you can teleport yourself to it. The thought was tempting, but Twilight dismissed it. That's okay, Spike. As the leader of Equestria, I have to set an example for my subjects and confront the things I don't like. She chuckled. Besides, it's just sand. How bad can it be? Spike grinned. That's the spirit. Now, come on, the surf's calling my name. Eagerly dashing down the beach, Spike didn't see Twilight hesitating for a moment before tentatively putting her hooves onto the sand. In years past, feeling the sand pouring over her hooves and getting tangled in her light layer of fur had felt so... wrong. Buried deep within her, Twilight's younger self instinctively wanted to leap back and get away from the sand, lest she needed to take a long shower to get every last grain and pebble out from her most intimate areas. Yet, there was something about this sand that Twilight had never felt before. It seemed like a thing alive, warm and soothing. It felt almost like it was caressing her. Well, Twilight mused, this is new. Twilight, come on, Spike called. Another step and Twilight made her way through the sand, slowly at first, not wanting the sand to get too high up her legs. Yet, she then found herself starting to jog, quickly catching up with Spike as she put up a large beach umbrella between two towels. So, which towel do you want, Twilight? Actually, Spike, I'm going to go without a towel. What? Grinning, Twilight stopped her hooves in the sand. This sand is different, Spike. It's not like any sand I've ever encountered before. Really? Uh, how? I, I can't say. Twilight scooped up a hoof full of sand, letting it trickle back down to the ground. It actually feels good. She smiled. Really, really good. Oh, well, that's great. Now, are you ready to have fun? You bet I am. My, my, Spike, if I had to guess, I'd think you had too much fun on your day off. Rarity joked as she walked down the halls of the palace beside Spike. He was rubbing his eyes and looking like he wanted nothing more than to be back in bed. It wasn't me, Rarity, Spike said, barely able to speak through his yawning. It was Twilight. She spent her whole day making sand castles, sand cities, sand towers, sand everything. She got so into it, it didn't stop until five this morning. Wait, really? Yeah, the guards and I kept trying to make her come to bed, but she just didn't. It was like she was obsessed. How peculiar, Rarity said. Being the sole ruler of Equestria was a stressful job, and Rarity expected Twilight to have some occasional displays of neurotic behavior. While Twilight had managed to control those urges as the years went on, Rarity knew they would always be there, just waiting for the right moment to emerge again. Well, perhaps it's just a one-time thing, Rarity assured Spike. After all, Twilight has been under a lot of stress lately. She just wanted to make the most of her free time. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's it. Yawning again, Spike took out a scroll and read through it. His stomach sinking the further down he went. Oh, it's going to be a long day. I'll have to ask the kitchens to keep brewing the coffee. Well, let's focus on getting the first thing off the list, Rarity suggested. I have Twilight's new dress ready. I can't wait to see her in it. Just imagine the princess of all Equestria wearing one of my most fabulous dresses when she greets ambassadors, royalty, and commoner alike. 
Pushing the door to the royal throne room open, Rarity found Twilight at her throne, and something else that hadn't been present the last time she had visited. Um, Twilight? Spike asked. What's with the sand? Giant mountains of sand filled the throne room, almost covering the stained glass windows. Only the lit chandeliers prevented the room from being submerged in darkness. Do you like it? Twilight asked as she clapped her hooves together. I thought the throne room could use a bit of a change. A few bits of sand slid onto the coronation carpet as Rarity struggled to make sense of what she was seeing. But why sand, darling? Why not some potted plants or maybe some new curtains? If you want curtains, I can... Curtains? Who needs curtains, Rarity? We have sand. We can build sand castles with commoners or swim through it with kings and queens from other lands. With a swan dive that put Equestria's finest swimmers to shame, Twilight dove into the nearest pile of sand, her horn cutting through it like a shark's fin. Uh, maybe later, Twilight. Spike brought up his itinerary. We have a lot of meetings to get through today. The Griffin Ambassador will be here in five minutes and he... Twilight rose from the sand, shaking herself off. Oh, Spike, who cares about meetings? You were right. I worked too hard. Today is going to be dedicated to playing. In fact, everyone can play with me. All the guards and all the staff, we can all play in the sand. But, darling, Rarity said, what about your dress? The one you order specifically for the ambass? Oh, that can wait, Rarity. We can always get new dresses. But we will never gain back the time we don't spend playing in sand. With a cheer, Twilight once again dove into the sand and swam through it, laughing the laugh of the carefree. Spike and Rarity watched Twilight swimming through the sand-filled throne room. They glanced at each other. They said nothing as they backed up through the doorway. Twilight, Spike said, this is getting out of hand. We can't keep filling the palace with sand. Sitting at the far end of the table in the dining room, Twilight chuckled as she ate her dinner. Oh, Spike, you can never have enough sand. Her horn glowed and more sand appeared beneath the table, bearing Twilight up to her waist, causing her to close her eyes and sigh like a soul that had found its place in the world. Twilight, look. Can't you just designate one room of the palace as a sand room? The staff can barely get through the halls, and the medical wing is running out of cream for all the rashes and chafe, but don't worry, Spike. In time, everyone will get used to it, and they'll love sand too. But do you really have to put sand in all the bedrooms? I mean, I have to keep moving my bed up so it doesn't get buried. Who needs blankets and mattresses, Spike? We have sand! Shoving her chair back, Twilight sank deeper into the sand until only her head was uncovered. It's so warm, it embraces you, and it feels so good! Sighting, Twilight sank even deeper into the sand until only her horn was left, and then that too vanished. A waiter struggled through the sand and put a plate of hay burgers before Spike trying and failing to discreetly brush sand off the buns. Guys, this is getting out of hand, Spike said. Twilight's gone mad. She's obsessed with sand. Applejack. Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash, having received Spike's summons, stood before him and Rarity in Cantalot's Park, safely hidden inside one of the most remote gazebos. From the urgency of his words, they had thought that Twilight had been kidnapped, or that Equestria was being evaded yet again, or that the world was in peril from some magically endowed monster, but they hadn't expected this. You... you want to run that by us again? 
Ramadash asked. It's all she ever talks about now, Spike said. She hasn't done any of her royal duties since we came back from vacation. All she does is keep filling the palace with sand and playing in it. Spike, is this a joke? Applejack asked. I got a whole bunch of apples that need to be picked and... I swear to you, Applejack, it most certainly is not. Rarity said. Spike's telling the truth. I've seen it myself. What did I tell you? Raymond Ash said. I always knew Twilight would snap one day. But why sand? Spike said. Why not sand? Pinky said. I mean, it's so cool. You can use it to build sand castles, then smash them down and build them up again. It's so much fun. But not when she's supposed to be running the country, darling. Rarity said. I think she's been cursed by some spell and we have to free her from it. The air popped as discord materialized above the worried ponies. I think I can help with that. Oh no, Applejack groaned. Let me guess, this is all you're doing, Discord. Guilty as charged. When I learned that Twilight was going to the beach last week, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to help her get over her distaste of sand. So I turned invisible, waited until she stepped on it, then cast an enchantment to make her fall in love with sand. He giggled. Oh, it worked perfectly. And it has been most enjoyable watching her fawn over sand like she would the most handsome stallion in all of Equestria. It might have been funny for a day or two, Fluttershy said, but it has to stop. Sighing, Discord nodded. I suppose you're right, dear. It was fun, but alas, all good things must come to an end. Raising his hand, Discord snapped his fingers, smiling at knowing that one of his silliest and most clever pranks that reached a successful conclusion. Then his smile turned into a frown. Discord? Fluttershy asked. Discord snapped his fingers again. Then again. Oh no! What's wrong? Spike asked, trying his hardest to ignore the crater-sized hole that had just opened in his gut. The enchantment! It's not going away! Not going away? What do you mean not going away? The enchantment must have grown so strong that it is now bound to Twilight's very soul, Discord said. I regret to say that Twilight will now want nothing in life but sand. That desire will consume her to a degree you cannot even imagine. Everyone was silent. Are you freaking kidding me? Spike said. This is a disaster! Rarity shrieked. The ruler of all Equestria wants nothing but sand and will ignore all her other duties until the country falls into chaos. Anarchy will reign. Everything falls apart. Oh, I like the sound of that, Discord said. Fluttershy glared at him. But, on second thought, that might... But, on second thought, that might be going a bit too far. I'm afraid the only course of action you have now is to use the elements of harmony, wipe the spell from her very soul, and restore our beloved princess to her old self. Spike and the others ran to the royal palace, where Spike grabbed hold of the doors and yanked them open only to be almost knocked off his feet as sand poured out. Come on! Spike yelled, his superior dragon strength letting him force his way through into the palace, the others following him into the darkened interiors of the palace. The air was saturated with a stench of dry, stale sand that flowed like rushing water. The smell choked everyone as they fought through hallways, trying their hardest not to be thrown off their hooves. Where is she? Rainbow Dash yelled, struggling to be heard over the roar of sand, grinding against the walls. Laughter drifted through the halls. Her bedroom, Spike said. This way. The six struggled long and hard until they reached the staircase leading up to Twilight's chambers. Here the sand finally stopped, allowing them to get back on solid ground and charge upwards to the bedroom door. Normally guarded by two of Cantalot's most elite guards, they were nowhere to be seen. Okay, everyone, Spike said. Here we go. You all ready? The others nodded, their own respective elements brought out and ready for action. The door was kicked open and Spike charged inside, only to be immediately bogged down by a tidal wave of sand that knocked him off his feet. 
behind him. Rainbow Dash and Fluttershy grabbed hold of Rarity and Pinkie Pie, lifting them up. Applejack, though old, still had her Earth Pony strength and managed to hold onto a pillar to keep herself from being swept away. The sand stirred as Twilight emerged from beneath the surface, serene, confident and blissful. Her eyes opened, sand trickling off her eyelashes as she studied her friends. Twilight, listen to me, Spike yelled. Discord cursed you. He enchanted the sand at the beach to make you love it. Twilight chuckled. Oh, Spike, I am no longer Twilight Sparkle. I am now Sandy Sanderson, Empress of all sand. What? A glow enveloped Twilight as she floated above the sand that flowed and swirled throughout the room. I was wrong, Spike. Friendship isn't magic. Sand is magic. Sand is love. Sand is life. Sand is everything. Everyone was speechless. It was a few moments before Rainbow Dash found her voice. Okay, anyone else getting creeped out? Do not be afraid, Rainbow Dash, Twilight said. You too will come to love sand. Right, that does it, Spike said. Twilight, I'm sorry, but we have to. Twilight's horn glowed and the elements of harmony were yanked off Spike's neck and the necks of the others. Metal, stone and crystal turned to sand and fell, joining the ocean of sand that continued to swirl around the room. Um, did, ah. Uh, Anyone have a plan B? Fluttershy whispered. I was lost, but now I am found, Twilight said, unfazed by the fact that her friends had tried to use the elements on her. My eyes have been awakened to the wonders of sand. Tendrils of sand rose up. And now, my friends, you too shall be enlightened. Spike yelled as he was grabbed by one of the sand tendrils and dragged beneath the swirling sand in the room quickly followed by the others. Their shocked screams drowned out beneath Twilight's laughter. Ponyville, one of the most charming communities to be found in all Equestria, was no more. Only a few days ago, it had been a charming community where everyone lived in peace, children played in the streets without fear, and anyone could sing songs and play with bunny rabbits all day long. Now it was buried under 50 feet of sand. So too was the ever-free forest in the surrounding areas. Tidal waves of sand had washed over them all and claimed the buildings, trees and their residents. It was not just the land around Ponyville. Manhattan had been claimed too, washed away by endless waves of sand that not only buried all the skyscrapers, but the oceans as well. The Crystal Empire was now the Sand Empire. Cludge Town? Well, there wasn't much that had changed in Cludge Town, as it had already been mostly sand. But now it was even sandier. In every land, in every continent, cities, Towns and settlements were vanishing beneath waves of sand, pouring forth from Canterlot. And it was towards Canterlot that a single airship flew in at attack speed. From the cockpit, Queen Chrysalis, leader of the last desperate alliance of peoples who had not been buried in sand, now directed their last ditch effort to save the world. Attack! Armies of changelings, ponies, yaks, griffins, and even bat ponies all dropped from the airship into the capital of Equestria. Each was armed with the best armor, the best weapons, the most powerful anti-sand enchantments that unicorns had been able to muster. A crystal glowed before Chrysalis. She tapped the surface and a magical projection of Turek appeared. Turek, report! Screams came from behind Turek. Chrysalis could just make out what looked like tendrils of sand snatching everyone and dragging them into the ever-increasing mass of the accursed sand. And then Turek was grabbed. He fought, but even his enormous muscles were helpless against the combined might of tons of sand. Chrysalis, he screamed. The sand, 
There's too much of it. It's too powerful. Shut up about sand. Just get to the palace and... Another wave of sand washed over Tarek, burying him and silencing his screams. Curses! Chrysalis threw the crystal aside and yanked on her battle helmet. Must I do everything myself? With wings beating, the changeling queen kicked open a door and rocketed towards Candlelight. Twilight Sparkle! She yelled. Come forth and face me! All the sand in Cantalot came together and rose high above the city, growing until a literal mountain of sand towered above the chrysalis. A small hole appeared in the mountain. Twilight floated out, only now her skin was gritty and coarse, and her eyes now glowed a magical beige. Princess! Chrysalis yelled. Stop this sand nonsense immediately! Twilight smiled. Sand? Yes, sand. You are ruining everything with your love of the cursed material. You! Others emerged from the mountain of sand. Chrysalis recognized them. They were the princess of the cursed friends. And now their eyes glowed like twilights. And sand constantly flowed from their bodies as they floated beside the empress of all sand. Sand, Twilight said. Sand, Spike said. Sand! sand. The others said in unison. Twilight stretched her arms wide as if wanting to hug Chrysalis. Sand! Sand shot out and enveloped Chrysalis. She yelled, trying to fight her way free as the sand hardened around her. Sand! Twilight said. Will you shut up about sand? Chrysalis yelled, but the sand engulfed her as she opened her mouth to yell again and the queen was encased in a warm, gritty tomb. Fluttershy turned to Applejack. Sand? Applejack nodded back. Sand. Chrysalis broke free from her tomb, her eyes now glowing beige. Sand! Yelled, weeping in joy as she embraced the sand that held her, wanting to hug it all day long. Sand! The others smiled. Sand! sand. With a contented sigh, Chrysalis dissolved, her body, her essence, her very soul becoming one with sand. Nodding her approval, Twilight Sparkle's horn glowed, and she too dissolved into the mountain. Her friends joined her, sighing in bliss as they returned to the sand. The mountain of sand dissolved and fell into the valley below, where it resumed flowing through the land. All was silent as wind softly blew over the deserts of Equus. There were no trees standing, no leaves for the wind to rustle. Not even a cactus could be seen upon the sand that stretched from one pole to another that covered every continent and filled in every ocean. To any observer, this would be a dead world, a lifeless world, a sandy world. At a remote and unremarkable part of the planet, Empress Sandy Standerson rose from the sand, using it to create a temporary body for herself as she surveyed her work. This world had once been infested with trees, grass, plant life, ice, fire, lava, rock and oceans. Cleansing and purifying it had been no easy feat, but she had accomplished it, and with it had brought true equality to all. There was no war, no conflicts, strife, suffering or pain. There was only sand. Sandy Sanderson wanted to laugh. Starlight Glimmer had been hopelessly naive when she believed that she could achieve true equality by taking away everyone's cutie mark, unaware that sand was the only truth in an uncaring world. But it didn't matter now. Starlight was one with sand, as were all the ponies, dragons, changelings, yaks and other species, all resting peacefully with sand's loving embrace. Given time, Sandy Sanderson might try to head to other worlds to spread the gospel of sand. Now ageless and formless, she had all of eternity to bring 
true equality and unity to the cosmos. Those dreams came to an end as a bright flash of green shot into the sand. With a flash bright enough to illuminate the cosmos, if only for a moment. Equus exploded, hurling the planet's molten remains into the icy void of space. Nearby, a grey metallic sphere in the void. Within its control room, a man in a grey uniform watched the scene. The planet has been destroyed, Lord Vader. Darth Vader, the Dark Lord of the Sith, said nothing as he pulled his hand away from the control panel and left the room leaving behind nothing but a few particles of the thing he hated more than anything else to drift forever within the endless void.